five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Winthrop Professor of African American Studies at Harvard, Walter Johnson. From the broken heart of America, St. Louis, and the violent history of the United States. Also on the program today, what does he say? We're opening up too soon. It's special election and primary day. California 25th, Wisconsin 7th, and Nebraska 2nd. Mitch McConnell wants to expand Bill Barr's surveillance powers in the Patriot Act renewal. The Supreme Court to hear key cases to determine if Donald Trump is above the law and if moral people can dictate your employment conditions. Meanwhile, Wuhan has six new cases. Six. So they will test 11 million people in 10 days. 11 million people in 10 days. What does the Republican Party do in the White House? Well, they're rolling out Obamagate. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Um, We are uh, here again. It's another day. We're moving uh, forward slowly. Uh, Parts of the country are uh, relaxing their restrictions. We are seeing infection rates go up. In just about every part of the country, except for New York City, where the rate of infection is going down. And uh, everything else uh, just moving along, as one would expect in this uh, instance. Um, Dr. Fauci uh, testified uh, to the Senate. In fact, I think he still may be doing so. Is he still is he still testifying? He. Um, they may have recessed by now. And uh, he was testifying via Zoom, I guess it was, or some other uh, mechanism. And uh, here's what he had to say today. I think we also should pay attention to that states, even if they're doing it at an appropriate pace, which many of them are and will, namely a pace that's commensurate with the dynamics of the outbreak, that they have in place already the capability that when there will be cases, there is no doubt, even under the best of circumstances, when you pull back on mitigation, you will see some cases appear. It's the ability and the capability of responding to those cases with good identification, isolation, and contact tracing will determine whether you can continue to go forward as you try to reopen America. So it's not only doing it at the appropriate time with the appropriate constraints, but having in place the capability of responding when the inevitable return of infections occur. All right, so here's the bottom line. Here, here's where the Trump administration has been uh, so such a massive failure. Nothing has changed in regards to the virus, the virus remains exactly the same. The only difference that we have now between March 12th and May 12th is that much of the country is far more sensitive to what we're dealing with. And we're any in the country that they will function in a way that will mitigate the spread of the disease, at least the speed of the spread of the disease. 
so that we don't overcome and overwhelm our medical uh, facilities. Now, in some parts of the country, they just don't get it and they very well may overrun their medical facilities. But the problem is, is that the Trump administration has completely failed to use this time to produce tests, to develop tests, to develop a protocol, to follow a game plan. There was literally a game plan. I think it was like 70 pages. I don't think it was called game plan, but I think it was pretty close. I think it was like what to do in a pandemic that was left them. They threw it out the window, literally. I don't know if they literally threw it out the window. I think they literally just shoved it aside. And we are not in a position to trace or test. I know that they're developing uh, these capacities. The states are, specific states. Federal government isn't. Specific states are going out and contracting different developers to develop apps. Some states may share it, others not. I know this for a fact. And it is absurd. This is what the federal government should be doing at this point. And they, they basically let that whole time just go away. And there's this sense amongst the, uh, the administration, obviously not Fauci, but there's this sense that like this is political. Political in the sense that they can defeat or, or it's, it's all perception. They, they really do think that the thing you don't, you, you don't have to fear COVID-19. What you do have to fear is fearing COVID-19. And that just doesn't work with a virus. It doesn't understand. You're not going to make it cocky and then knock it out of the box. It doesn't work that way. And so they have wasted all of this time on doing nothing. And meanwhile, in Wuhan, they have six new cases and they are, have the ability, and I understand obviously their system of government is a little bit different than ours, but they have the technological ability to test 11 mil million people over 10 days. Just, they're, they're, they're going to outpay, they're going to lap us in terms of ability to test by a factor of, I don't even know. I can't do math that well. And the testing is relevant because you want to get a sense of where you are in the spread of the disease, of the virus, and you want to be able to trace it. And that way you can slow its, you can, you can manage the infection rate. And you can manage maybe what parts of your population get the infection as we head to uh, herd immunity. Because we're not going to get uh, a vaccine before we get to herd immunity. I mean, I think it's, it's becoming like apparent. Um, and so you need to do this in a very controlled manner. And I think Fauci is basically saying like, um, we're missing the key element that we need to keep us from having to go back to where we were for two months. But um, we shall see. I don't know, folks. I did some back of the envelope. Um, I mean, it's just basic numbers. 20%, if you assume 20% infection in New York City, for instance, at about 335,000 uh, cases of infection, you need to have three times that until you get close to herd immunity. It took 60 days this time, but now we're down to 2,700 infections per day. And that's about 250 days before we get to 60%. May add another 50 days to get to 70%, but that presumes, you know, some type of like that, that type of rate at 2,700. So the rest of the country is going slower, obviously, because it's not quite as dense. So we'll see. This couldn't happen. Uh, this, uh, this offer couldn't be more apropos. One of today's sponsors is BetterHelp. They're giving our audience 10% off their first month when they go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. 
BetterHelp gives you access to your own fully licensed and accredited therapist. You can do it over the phone. You can do it over chat. You can do it over video. Uh, a lot of therapists, I imagine, have long wait lists. It can take weeks or months before they see you. When you sign up with BetterHelp, they match you with a therapist based on your specific needs. You'll be communicating with them in less than 24 hours. Look, uh, stressful times, difficult times, obviously difficult time to go out and find a therapist. Uh, IRL, I can tell you, um, I've been in therapy off and on for uh, decades. I don't think that should become as a surprise to anybody, but um, I'm continuing my therapy remotely and uh, it's helpful. It's, it's helpful. It's very important uh, for me uh, in my situation. Uh, and folks are isolated. Nice to have an opportunity to talk to somebody who is a professional. And once BetterHelp connects you with a therapist, if you don't think it's a good fit, they let you switch to a new one at any time for no reason, for no additional charge. Uh, they have thousands of licensed therapists from all over the country. They'll have therapists who... Um, are trained to deal with specialties, specific needs that you might have. BetterHelp also tends to be more affordable than therapists that you would find through traditional means. You don't have to have insurance to use BetterHelp. They have financial aid options for those who qualify. BetterHelp has given everyone in our audience 10% off your first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash majority report. Also, this is also very helpful uh, during this time. All our ads are uh, today. Uh, oh, shoot. What was the name of the book? Well, we got a, uh, a shipment from Literarity. It is the subscri uh, subscription book club. Makes it easy and um, convenient, and particularly in this moment, to find unique and interesting books for your kids. They deliver great stories straight to your doorstep. Literati knows that home deliveries are going to be critical in meeting uh, your needs during this period and in terms of dealing with educational uh, materials. Reading books together will help create a time of adventure and bonding for your family and has real educational benefits. Kids who read books have better vocabularies. They have longer attention spans. I mean, frankly, that's basically what we're doing. We, I'm just encouraging Saul to read, and he read his uh his first sort of long book the other night stayed up all hours of the night, but um, I can't even remember the one that we have that he loves from literati. That is, um, I don't know. It's a little kid and he's a knight. Anything that involves swords. Saul is uh, all in on, but each literati box contains five beautiful books based on a theme contains exclusive original art and a personalized note to your kid. You only keep your favorites. You send back the rest for free comes in a box Easy to ship it back out. Just leave it on your uh, stoop or your, and uh, they pick it up and they return it. Um, reading with Saul has been one of the few things that I've enjoyed during this period of time, to be honest with you. Um, and he is reading those books too. This is a great uh, service. Um, great way. You're sitting there. You're looking for things for the kids to do. Uh, reading is, uh, this is a good time for that. And for a limited time, go to literati.com slash majority for 25% off your first two orders. This is their best offer available anywhere. You have to go to it to get it. Literati, L-I-T-E-R-A-T-I dot com slash majority for 25% off your first two orders. Literati.com slash majority. And lastly, Skillshare. One of our... Uh, make it possible to bring you the majority report today. And the first 500 people who go to skl.sh slash majority report eight, are going to get a free premium membership to Skillshare for an entire two months. I've talked about Skillshare a lot. I've been using it um, quite a bit, particularly during this time. It's an online learning community, offers thousands of classes on almost any topic you imagine. All classes are taught by experts in their field. They have classes on drawing. They have classes on painting, photography, video editing, web design. I don't know, running a small business, ukulele play, playing, baking bread. Almost all the classes are less than an hour long. Every class is split up into bite-sized lessons. Easy to fit Skillshare into your week, even if you have a busy schedule. I'm busy right now. And it's also very, makes it easier for like teens to absorb. And this is a good time. 
uh, to sit teens down. They want to watch a video. Now they can actually learn something. Skillshare has classes for every skill level. Whether you're wanting to get better at something you're, uh, or you have a, uh, want to get better at something you have a lot of experience with or you want to learn something new or somewhere in between. Membership to Skillshare, less than 10 bucks a month. It gives you access to their entire library of classes. But the first 500 people go to skl.sh slash majority report eight. You're going to get a free membership for two whole months. Put the link in our YouTube uh, description and in our podcast description for Skillshare and um, our other advertisers today. Check it out. Do yourself a favor. I am um, I'm not getting appreciably better at the uh, ukulele through Skillshare, but I'm getting somewhat better. All right, we're going to take a uh, quick break. And when we come back, uh, we'll be talking to Professor Walter Johnson on the broken heart of America, St. Louis, the vi- and the violent history of the U.S. Be right back after this. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the program the Winthrop Professor of History and African American and African Studies at Harvard, the author of The Broken Heart of America, St. Louis, and the Violent History of the United States, or U.S. Uh, Professor Walter Johnson, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Let's start with um, why you focus on St. Louis. I mean, I know that part of it is uh, biographical and part of it is captured in a quote um, that you would tell of a reporter in the seventies. And I'm going to butcher the quote, but it was something to the effect of St. Louis is like a Eugene O'Neill play, Uh, not necessarily typical, but certainly representative of all the dynamics that can exist in a city. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, there's various ways of explaining why I came to to feel that this is so important. I think that that the one that you um, you just pointed to is the one that I, I sort of learned as I was doing the research, which is that a lot of the things that we consider to be American history turn out to have happened in St. Louis whether that's the Missouri Compromise, the Dred Scott decision, or the first general strike in the history of the United States, or the first general emancipation, or East St. Louis race massacre, or, um, you know, the the major, major Supreme Court cases for housing rights, for employment rights, all came out of St. Louis, all the way up to Ferguson. And so as I started to research the history, I was was struck by that. the, the thing that I learned in addition to that really is that St. Louis was the hub of the United States 19th century empire. And so hidden behind the sort of happy talk of the gate to the West and the, the architecture of the arch is the history of, of United States imperialism. And so what I came to see really is that St. Louis um, was exemplary of, and in fact, it was the site of the, the, um, the mixing together of U.S. imperialism and, and anti-blackness. And so that's, that's what, you know, became the, the kind of defining idea behind the book. Um, I, I, uh, I, I have become uh, very, um, just as a, I guess, a little bit of a hobby, uh, interested in Reconstruction o- o- over the past right. uh, year or two. And, and, um, and obviously, uh, you know, to, to understand where you end up in Reconstruction, you got to understand a little bit of how you got into the, to the Civil War. And what I found really fascinating about what, uh, the way that you 
uh, about the, this connection you found through um, uh, St. Louis being the um, sort of the staging area for the Indian Wars. Um, and it, that dynamic of removal of Native Americans carried over into their, uh, the, their, the, the perspective towards uh, Blacks uh, right. in leading up to the Civil War. I mean, talk about, I mean, first, I guess, you know, tell us a little bit about the history of it as a staging grounds for the Indian Wars and establish that notion of, uh, of a removal policy. And then I guess let's talk about how that um, ended up uh, implicating the, 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 the perspective uh, towards uh, Blacks at that time, which was also, I guess, maybe counterintuitively for us today, um, aligned with the abolitionist movement. Terrific. So, yes, I mean, there's, there's a lot there. Let me see if I can, you know, try and get through it without too many tangles. Um, you know, the, the first thing to think about is that the St. Louis was the headquarters of the Western Department of the Army. And the Western Department of the Army from really the 1830s on was um, fighting Indian wars. That, that's what the army did. The army existed to fight Indian wars. And all of the Indian wars in the, in the West, and even some of the wars in the East, including the Seminole War, were staged out of or substantially supported from Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. And so, and, and that, um, that, that military effort had behind it a philosophy, a philosophy of um, ethnic cleansing and, and genocide with which we're familiar. The thing that, that struck me as I started to write about that and then write about the subsequent history was the way that ideas about ethnic cleansing, about the notion of a white man's country, Missouri and the West as a white man's country, then carried over into the way that um, various elites and um, eventually the state of Missouri tried to govern free people of color and, and even responded to the institution of slavery. And so what I end up arguing is that there is a strain of anti-blackness, a Western strain of anti-blackness that is removalist. So you can say what you want about Southern anti-blackness and slavery, and it was disgusting and dangerous and um, deadly in its own way, but it's not removalist the entire political economy of the South in the first half of the 19th century is dependent upon the presence of enslaved people, on the presence and reproduction of black people. That's not the way that many in Missouri looked at it. So there is a struggle within the state of Missouri that is effectively a class struggle between slaveholding whites and non-slaveholding whites. And non-slaveholding whites are interested in establishing a policy that they believe will be more equal between white people by excluding at least at the outset free people of color, right? That they are, they're very, very threatened by free people of color. And so it's my argument, like, it's not only my argument, that it is that non-slaveholding white Western um, view of the West as the white man's country that, that coheres into the free soil movement, into the idea that the fight, with the, the, the fight with the South must be to keep slavery out of the West. The notion of keeping slavery out of the West is again not, um, not advocated because these, these people have any great deal of sympathy for African Americans but it's because they believe that the absence of slavery will be the guarantee of white male equality. And there's a, there's a quotation in the book, I, I'm not gonna be able to get it off the top of my head, but where a Missouri Senator called H. Gratz Brown, who's one of the, the exemplars of this tendency in American politics says, you know, he, he begins to advocate for the gradual emancipation of enslaved people in Missouri. And he says, I, I'm not doing this because I, I like black people. I hate black people just as much as you do. I'm doing this because I love white people. I love white equality. 
And so what I try to suggest is that Missouri points the way to a kind of a white supremacist anti-slavery that comes to define a, a significant part of the, the Republican Party and the opposition to slavery in the 1850s and, and even through the 60s and on. So, and just to be clear about the sequencing, and 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 maybe this was th- these these things were happening simultaneously. The um, there was a segment of the white population that wanted essentially to uh, to uh, did not want slavery to take hold in the West because it would create wealth inequality, right? I mean, if I have a free labor force, right. I'm going I'm to make a lot of money, and it's going to create a wealth inequality. It's also theoretically going to depress my wages. Um, uh, you know, in some fashion, and they also did not want free uh, black folk just simply out of their racism or as part of uh, of 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 obscuring the class impetus in terms of uh, abolishing slavery. So a, a lot of fear of labor competition. Um, but the, I think the other thing is, is, is that there is a degree of racialized class resentment. And so one of the interesting things about St. Louis is th- there's not a, a large population of free people of color, but there's, a, there's a, a consequential population of free people of color, some of whom are quite wealthy. And so I think part of the, the underlying dynamic is that you have Um, white people coming to St. Louis after the War of 1812, really really beginning in large numbers around 1816, 1820. And um, as they get there, they encounter a kind of what I'd call Creole population, like like a a population of free people of color who have been there in families from the Spanish era and the French era. You know, some, some of these folks are, they're grocers, they are barbers, um, they are, are ministers and, and some have fairly substantial wealth. And so the, the you know, prosperous white people stayed in Virginia, right? I mean, if, if, you're, if you're doing well in Virginia, there's no real need for you to, to move to Missouri. And so it's a kind of a, a striving up and coming um, class of people who comes to Missouri. And I think that they then encounter um, a a set of free people of color who are in many cases um, have fairly, you know, strong social alliances with wealthy whites in St. Louis. And so that sets up a kind of a complicated um, dynamic of class and and racial resentment that I think characterizes the period. And so then you see through the, you know, through the period before the Civil War in, in Missouri and, and, and in St. Louis, an increasingly kind of draconian set of efforts to curtail the, um, the mobility, the employability, and, and finally to drive out, to extraterritorialize the, the free color population. And, and, and this is a theme, this, this removal theme is something that's sort of like is embedded in some ways in, in St. Louis's um, I don't know, DNA, I guess, uh, carrying forward. I mean, it's interesting because I, I would imagine on some level you, um, the, you could find a, uh, an analog with the South that um, the way that labor is treated today is in some ways maybe, um, you know, embedded in, in part of the DNA from the South and the way that they perceived um, uh, slaves at that time. I don't know, but uh, I just, it's an interesting concept. Yeah. Um, but I tried to, to, you know, I mean, ha- having noticed it in the 19th century, it was on my mind as I, I went forward. And, and what I saw really was a, a kind of a succession of um, efforts at, at spatial control and expropriation. And so the way that, you know, when I, when I looked at the East St. Louis race massacre, it certainly began as a conflict over black labor and over black men employed as strike bakers in the in the industrial plants in East St. Louis, particularly in the aluminum ore plant. But really, what it turned into, and this has been, I think, less um, well treated in the existing literature, 
is it turned into an effort to, to, to drive black people out of East St. Louis entirely, to go into the neighborhoods and to, to burn down the houses. So it turned into an attack on black domestic life, on black women, on black children, on the possibility of a black future in East St. Louis. And then I follow that through the destruction um, for a different set of capitalist imperatives, um, more or less imperatives this time around um, real estate speculation, um, the destruction of a neighborhood called Mill Creek Valley, which um, that was torn down in, uh, in 1956. It's an area of almost 500 acres. 20,000 people lived there. There were 800 institutions, business institutions, cultural institutions. And it was torn down more or less on a, on a kind of a, a speculation that never came to fruition. So if you go to St. Louis today, there's still a terrific scar on the south side of the city where this neighborhood was and where very little has come back. And then, you know, I trace that forward to, to the pruitt Igo housing project, which was blown up beginning in 1972. You know, again, another, another displacement that reflected a still different set of um, capitalist institutional imperatives and finally out to, to North County to Ferguson where it's, there's a, you know, the, that, that population, that working class, working poor, poor population um, has, has found a, another foothold and yet is now kind of um, being, I, I, I argue, um, rendered up for a final round of extraction, a final round of, of profit taking based on for-profit policing and payday loans and, um, and mass incarceration. Um, let's talk about the, I mean, because you have these, uh, the, I mean, just to sort of like a, blunt tools, I guess, in terms of just the destruction of these neighborhoods and, uh, and, and, and violent attacks on, on where um, uh, black folk are living in St. Louis. Talk about the degree in which um, A, St. Louis is a segregated a city and, and, and segregated both in terms of like, um, uh, you can see it in the context of race, but you can see it in all of the social I guess, measures uh, that we might take demographic, class-wise, health-wise. Um, just give us some basic uh, uh, sense of that disparity. And, and then I want to sort of just head into sort of the um, more legalistic mechanisms in which that, th that segregation was created. Yeah, so I mean, the... the Today, you know, people in St. Louis talk about the Del Mar Divide. And when they talk about the Del Mar Divide, they're talking about a particular east-west traffic artery that runs more or less through the middle of the street. And the idea is that everything north of Del Mar is black and everything south of Del Mar is white. Now, that's um, particularly south of Del Mar. That's not entirely true. But every single um, metric of social well-being that you can imagine, whether it's the rate of childhood asthma or the rate of broadband internet access or whether it's income or lifespan or um, years in public education or vulnerability to traffic accidents or homicide or police shooting, you can track along that single line in St. Louis. And um, what you see north of Del Mar in, in North St. Louis today is, um, I think, you know, to, to most people who haven't been there is, is unfathomable. Um, if you look from, you know, if, if you get on Google Earth right now and you look at a map of St. Louis, a photographic map of St. Louis, North St. Louis will appear to be green. And the reason that it appears to be green is because there is so much um, vacancy, there's endemic vacancy and abandonment, and so many of the, the houses are torn down that, that the, the city is um, in many ways empty. You know, to, to be in North St. Louis in the middle of the afternoon, the, the closest um, analog that, that I have is, is being in some neighborhoods in New Orleans in the months after Katrina, it's, there's, there's a sense of emptiness. There's nobody moving. You can look for five blocks along a straight street and not see any motion. And so it's, it is a, um, it, it's, 
it's something that sociologists call hypersegregation, which means that somebody in North St. Louis can go, an African American in North St. Louis can go for, you know, a month without seeing a white person, right? Except for maybe a um, a gas, you know, somebody who owns a gas station, or maybe um, certainly police, right? And so it is a very, very segregated city. At the same time, you have um, a number of municipalities. Um, among them, three of the wealthiest municipalities in the entire United States um, that are 95, 98% white in St. Louis County. So it's, um, it's a highly segregated metropolitan area. Um, and that has everything to do with, um, with the history and with the, the money that people have made off of, off of racial animosity and um, the kind of social distancing that goes along with whiteness is is um, the the metropolitan area of St. Louis is it is it particularly um, balkanized in terms of the way that um, uh, it's it's organized in terms of like charters and, and and whatnot? Absolutely, no. I mean, it's famously so. So, um, St. Louis County, there are around ninety municipalities in St. Louis County. And I think people always point to the, the smallest municipality in St. Louis County is a little town called Champ that has um, seven inhabitants. But it's not, it's not unusual to find a municipality of four or 500 people in, in St. Louis County. And, and the reason is, is that during the era of um, I guess what you would call white flight and suburbanization. And I would want those things to be understood as processes that were subsidized by the federal government and enabled by the banks and real estate speculators. Um, people would just set up a little town that was basically an excuse to have a zoning ordinance. And what the zoning ordinance did is it, it put limitations on the use of property within the, the city limits that would exclude, um, ex ex they were designed, intended, often explicit, you know, uh, often tap, you know, sort of in the, in the not nudge, nudge, wink, wink way of, of racial exclusion to exclude African Americans. They did so through mechanisms that also excluded working class and, and poor white people. So um, single family dwellings only, uh, or um, minimum lot sizes. And so there are towns in, in St. Louis where you'll have a minimum lot size of, uh, of an acre, right? So you, you're not allowed to build a house in, in this town unless you're building a house on an acre of land. Well, only wealthy people can do that. And so, it, you know, in, in suburban St. Louis, people have absurdly, in some of these towns, have absurdly large yards. And, and so that's, a, that's, again, that's another artifact of the process by which the county was sort of chopped up into piecemeal municipalities that were basically excuses to to have discriminatory zoning codes. Yeah, I, I was just struck by the number of those municipalities within the context of a county. I mean, it's it's. I mean, that's I I I, I just I'm relative. To, I mean, I grew up in Massachusetts, and I just know, like, relatively speaking, that just seems like an enormous amount. Like, like, you know, fivefold more Absolutely. than uh, we would get in Massachusetts. And um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the um, and, and again, um, I, I think, you know, over the years, we've, we've certainly talked about these various mechanisms in which um, segregation was imposed, particularly as we go from like the, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, well into the 50s by by, you know, official means, as it were. Uh, but they all seem to have uh, been employed uh, significantly in St. Louis. I mean, let's talk about some of these, like some of the covenants um, and um, and and also the the, the backstopping of mortgages uh, for white people as opposed to black people. Right. So so St. Louis um, in 1916 was one of the first. Um, cities in the United States to pass, pass a housing segregation ordinance. Um, but there was a um, Supreme Court decision, the Buchanan decision in 1917, which um, declared that 
housing segregation ordinances were unconstitutional. And so the, um, the tool of, of the trade for real estate speculators and um, white separatists came to be the, um, the restrictive covenant. And what a restrictive covenant is, is it's a, it's a clause in the deed by which one person sells a house to another, or it, it's a sort of a neighborhood association often will um, have a clause written into a deed that says, well, you can buy this house now on, on the condition that you promise you will never sell the house to a Negro or Malay. And these, um, these kinds of restrictions were written into um, housing deeds all over the United States. And so, you know, in, in Minneapolis, you can find them. You find them all over California. You find them in St. Louis. You can, you can find them in almost every city in the United States. And that then created a... Um, a two-tier housing market in St. Louis for a long time, for, for basically the years between um, 1917 and, and 1947. That was the, the mode of segregation. At the same time, or simultaneously in the, in the 1930s, um, I think 1934, the, um, the federal government created the, the um, uh, Federal Housing Agency, which um, gave out, which provided um, loan guarantees um, to prospective home buyers. But because they were providing loan guarantees, they did a risk assessment on, um, you know, whether or not they're guaranteeing loans that they believe are going to succeed or fail. And the way that they assessed risk was by the racial composition of the neighborhood in which the loan was being granted. And so this is where the phrase redlining comes from, is that there were certain neighborhoods that were um, majority black or, or majority non-white that were viewed as um, places that were dangerous to loan money for housing. So in the era of restrictive covenants, that began as a, um, a kind of a racial practice on the, a racist practice on the, on the part of the federal government that was turbocharged by the covenant. In 1947, in a case that came from St. Louis, Shelley versus Kramer, a housing rights case, very famous housing rights case, the Supreme Court ruled that um, restrictive covenants were unenforceable, legally unenforceable. Um, one interesting footnote to that is that three of the nine members of the court had to recuse themselves yes. in the case because they themselves lived in covenanted neighborhoods, right? So after that, um, that, that's when you, when you really reach the, um, you really enter the era of, um, of, of sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, white supremacy in, in suburbanization. And this is the very moment that the federal government is beginning to, to imagine and then construct the interstate highway system, which really um, begins in St. Louis. And they're doing so partly under the guidance of a guy called Harlan Bar Bartholomew, who was the, which he, he might, you might call him the suburbanization czar of the United States. And so Bartholomew was an urban planner, extremely um, influential in the history of the United States, St. Louis based, who was obsessed with automobiles and um, single family suburban housing. And so St. Louis was really his, his laboratory. And so it's, it's at that moment then that um the the practices uh you know the, the white flight in st louis really takes off to the county and is is subsidized still through these um unequally allocated um loan guarantees from the federal government and and also um from the by the gi bill which supports um loan guarantees for white but not for black um veterans generally and so, so that's the, the era where the, the municipalities begin to sprout. And then, then even in the case, even in cases where um, an individual African-American is able to, to jump through all the hurdles and manage to purchase a piece of property um, in according, you know, with the zoning laws, then, then that's where the 
the um, basic extra legal, violent, direct action, um, vigilantism takes takes place. And so there are many incidences in many incidents in the history of St. Louis of black people moving into a neighborhood or onto a block and having their houses vandalized, their front windows broken, um, you know, the air let out of their tires, crosses burned in their yard, all the all the things that, that we know happened over and over again. And so that, you know, that there's a final uh, kind of frontier of resistance that, that has to do with direct action on the part of white vigilantes. And I, and I think there's a, I mean, that is, that, that seems like a, a natural progression on some level, right? When the, when the institutional support uh, becomes uh, for that type of segregation starts to wane, um, you, you know, that's what you rely on. Like, I'm not convinced that we're not seeing that writ large, frankly, in this country, in many respects, uh, maybe it's a little more slow moving and, and a little bit more obscured. Um, but let's, um, the, you know, there's some things I want to talk about in terms of the dynamic of uh, property taxes. And, and it's, I think it's well known in the wake of, of the protests in Ferguson about how um, the, uh, the African American community, particularly in uh, Ferguson, was basically uh, used as a, an ATM uh, by the municipality. And uh, you write about how it also is not just a question of sort of control, uh, but also a, a way of subsidizing, uh, you know, uh, major corporations that come in and don't have to pay the property taxes that would one would anticipate. And this is a way of making up for that. But what I want to do is, is sort of jump to what's going on today with COVID-19. I know you've written about that. And the dynamic that we're seeing with COVID-19 is, I guess, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, forged in these dynamics that we've been talking about. I mean, just uh, for a moment, let's just uh, uh, touch on uh, on this, because these, it, it, the, the, like any type of crisis, it seems to me, in most instances, um, it begins to sort of reveal as the as the uh, as the tide goes out, you start to see uh, who is most vulnerable and who is, uh, you know, whose boat is 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 most sort of, I guess, um, uh, uh, beached, as it were. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, I was I was on here listening a little bit um, before you brought me on. And I think one of the things you said is the virus doesn't discriminate, right? The virus doesn't know the difference between African Americans and white people. But in St. Louis, um, in the city, you have a population that's, um, you know, basically 47% black, and almost three quarters of the cases are um, of the of the documented COVID cases. And and we would have to then imagine the the difference in testing in the in the white and black communities three quarters of the documented cases are among african americans so you have a hugely dis disproportionate um rate of, of viral infection in the african american community and and that is not explicable according to any kind of simple immediate notion of um white racism it is explicable only into a in, in in terms of a deep and historical notion of white racism. And so what I mean by that is is that the virus itself isn't racist, but the infection rates reflect the spatial and social character of a city in which race and white supremacy have been structured into the fabric and the daily life of all of the inhabitants. And so the, the piece I wrote with a, a, another historian and a, a professor of public health at Washington University, Colin Gordon is the historian, the professor of public health is Jason Purnell, and an activist, Jamala Rogers um, from St. Louis, who runs the Organization for Black Struggle, tries to document the history of spatial control and of um, social disinvestment in North St. Louis, including the closing of the, the hospital in North St. Louis, the public hospital of North St. Louis, um, which was a nationally renowned black hospital, Homer G. Phillips in 1979, um, to, to help us understand the way that, that, you know, to help us understand these racial disparities as indicative of um, 
inequality and injustice that are deeply structured into our society. Um, and and lastly, uh, just also we, we should just touch on Ahmed Arbery um, because this is um, I don't know this is I mean it's a it is a a fairly I don't want to say classic case but I mean this is um, uh, you know I don't know that it's getting the same attention that, that it that it that it should or would uh, you know absent all the the sort of news about COVID nineteen. Uh, but we're in a situation where the the Georgia Attorney General is asking the feds to come in. Uh, my sense is that uh, under um, the pr- uh, previous administration, the feds would already be there um, at this juncture. But um, just give me your sense of 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 something like that, particularly in the wake of what we've seen, whether it was Michael Brown, but other um uh killings that uh of 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 black folk at the hand of 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 white uh folks with guns well it's a lynching right so a a lynching is when um vigilante whites take the law into their own hands and and murder black people and that's what that is and so in that sense it is um it's on a spectrum list, but it's it's a little bit different from the police murders from Tamir Rice and and Michael Brown say it's it's a little bit more similar to Trayvon Martin. I think um, that the the thing that I think most powerfully about this, and this is something that I learned from watching um, both of those cases, Trayvon Martin and and, and Michael Brown, um, is that this is something that happened, I guess, at this point, almost three months ago. And what what I learned from that is how hard it is to bring these things to light, right? I mean, it was a very similar story in the case of Trayvon Martin, where where the murder happened. And it took months for um, activists to gain the traction to get the murder national attention. And that seems to me to be what's happened in Georgia. Um, and, and didn't happen in the case of Michael Brown because um, the, the people were in the streets so quickly and were, were able to, to gain the attention. And so, so I guess what I see in those stories is w- what's, what's interesting and terrifying to me about that is, first of all, to imagine that there are many stories that we don't hear about. I think that's um, unarguable. And secondly, the difficulty that there is in, in trying to, to get the story out, but, but thirdly, then to emphasize the, the action, the, the radical truth telling um, that, that people do um, in order to, to finally get these stories out. Um, just, you know, in, in relationship to what we've been talking about, about race and space, I mean, it is a, it's, a, it's a spatialized racial killing, right? The, the notion is that there are... Um, neighborhoods in which by design and through through concerted historical action um any african-american person looks out of place and so you know the the first thing that that i i i see when i see one of those cases is the the evidence of of history and of the successful history of of white supremacy in creating an environment in which African Americans are are hyper visible in um, most neighborhoods, most white neighborhoods of the United States. Walter Johnson, the book is The Broken Heart of America, St. Louis and the Violent History of the United States. We will put a link to that at uh, majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been it's been uh, energizing. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. All right. Thanks again. All right, folks. We will uh, take a uh, quick break, head into the uh, fun half in a moment. Um, We have Nomiki on. We want to bring. Oh, we do have uh, Nomiki on. Okay, great. Um, I should tell you that um, uh, this show relies on your support Um, to keep on trucking. You can become a member at uh, jointhemajorityreport.com. And uh, we have a couple of people who have taken up the offer of um, uh, who are going through some financial stress. They have emailed at majority reporters at gmail.com. Have patience. We will, uh, I promise you, we will get to you. Uh, Sometimes we get a little backed up. Um, But uh, if you are someone who can't afford to become a member, but want the extra content, 
uh, by all means, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. If you are someone who's been, uh, you know, listening to the show, enjoying the show, and you are fortunate enough uh, to be financially secure at this time and can't afford a membership, uh, by all means, um, we would really appreciate the support. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Don't forget also uh, the AM Quickie. You can sign up for that at amquickie.com and justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. Uh, don't forget, check out the Noma Key Show, right? Who's What, what are you doing this week? Uh, um, oh, I, I've been giving you, I realize I've been giving you the things I taped this week because we're a weekly show. So on this week's show, we have a very long interview with John Nichols and candidate Samalise Lopez, who's running in the Bronx. She's an extraordinary candidate. We show her video. Her campaign ad is like AOC worthy and her story is is too Amazing um, story. I, I interviewed amazing. her some time back, and it, it really people should check the check her candidacy out. Yeah, really she impressive. was homeless, and you know her her mother um, uh, escaped a domestic violence situation in Puerto Rico, and you know really worked her way up. Uh, and I've and the strange thing is, I've actually known her for out of all of the candidates that we've worked with, I actually knew her pretty well from from activism. So it's nice to see like people you know um, you know move up and hope I'm, I'm really hoping that she pulls off a win because who's to say that election's going to be it's like 25 candidates and yeah you know, no one's no one knows what's going to happen it's a low turnout district in the poorest district in the country so yep uh stunning story she has uh also uh, tonight is tuesday so uh you can check out the michael brooks show at uh, yeah Pitch- We've got uh, Maximilian Alvarez of Working People Pod on, and Adolf Reed returns for his second interview tonight. Ooh. It's only his second interview? Uh, I think maybe we've, we've actually, we've, second live interview, I should say. Uh, second live show. interview. Yeah. Um, and you can find that at um, uh, patreon.com TMBS or The Michael Brooks Show on YouTube, youtube.com slash The Michael Brooks Show. Also, check out The Antifada patreon.com slash the antifada and uh there's a lot of things going on this week for the antifada jamie had like a like three or four different things that were happening over the course of the week but uh, so check that out and matt um yeah what, did, one, what are you gonna be doing on twitch today yeah one thing happening at literary hangover and it's called twitch.tv slash literary hangover uh i'm currently playing kingdom come deliverance listening to some carl kautsky and perry anderson on feudalism and early communism so uh check that out folks subscribe twitch.tv slash literary hangover there you go all right quick break we'll be right back fun hack all right one second oh shoot here we go here Here we go i'm still on (laughs) actually (laughs) well yes matt is there a problem hi my mic was on (laughs) it's still on (laughs) left is best Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous. You're a little bit uh, upset. You're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. My first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail.
Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. I think I might be a Nazi. Agree. No. Death to America. Do. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way. Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Fun. We are back. Fun half. You there? Know me? I am. You caught my hot mic moment. <laughs> sure. <laughs> a little behind the scenes. Just complete. Need my glasses. <laughs> and I'm all strapped in here. I was like, Mom, can you bring me my glasses? <laughs> I don't know if people heard uh, my uh, my children screaming at the top of their lungs during that uh, interview. I hope um, <laughs> I hope the professor understands I was not um, in some type of, uh, I was not in mortal danger. Um, <laughs> but uh, know me, I'm glad you're here. Uh, because you, this is a bit of a celebration, uh, because according to uh, Donald Trump, oh, yeah. we have prevailed. Um, now, prevailed as in past tense. We're not <laughs> attempting to prevail. We have prevailed. It's we've it's over. It, it's over. Mm-hmm. We're we've we won. Mission accomplished is another way to say that. Here is Donald Trump. Uh, writing one of uh, Joe Biden's uh, campaign ads. Exactly. This is number one. And we have saved. And if you look at on a per 100,000 basis, we're at the best part of the pack right on the bottom. Germany and us are leading the world. Germany and the United States are leading the world. Lives saved per 100,000. In every generation, through every challenge and hardship and danger, America has risen to the task. We have met the moment, and we have prevailed. Americans do whatever it takes to find solutions, pioneer breakthroughs, and harness the energies we need to achieve a total victory. Day after day, we're making tremendous strides with the dedication of our doctors and nurses. These are incredible people. These are so inspiring. So inspiring. Mission accomplished. I'm awestruck. Mission accomplished. Um, now, of course, uh, rate of infection going down in Germany, rate of infection going up in this country. Right. Um, and so a little bit premature. I mean, this is what so they call more people like right. we well, have more people that are saved as a result. There are more people without the infection because we have more people. And, and, and there are more first. people that, that are, uh, don't have the infection. But even on a per capita basis, we're heading in the wrong direction. This is the classic case of spiking the football uh on the I, I would say you know sometimes you hear people say like oh you're spiking the football on like the 10 yard line or the or the or the five yard line or i think we're close to like the 40 yard line and it's if there's any argument about that it's just like are we on the opposing team's 40 yard line or our own 40 yard line <laughs> where donald trump is spiking the ball um Well, he's just doing whatever he can to keep the economy. I mean, the whole argument that Republicans are making, obviously they want to make money, right? But they also want to win the election. And if that unemployment rate goes, continues to rise towards, you know, what it is right now, the rate it's going, it's going to be undeniable that you could walk Joe Biden into the election as a quiet, like as a corpse, basically, and he would win against Trump. So I think that's ultimately what this is about is. Oh, without a doubt. He can't be the wartime president. Because it's not working. Well, the problem is that that they they have and they don't seem to sort of like they 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 can't wrap their heads around this is that um they cannot stop the virus. Right. 
they cannot convince people it is safe to go back to a whole range of activities that would constitute a normally functioning economy. And so, you know, what he needs to be doing is, I think, the opposite of what he's doing, frankly. I mean, from just a sheer political standpoint, which is to increase the sense of risk that there is and make it like he's protecting everybody. Um, but I think to a certain extent, there's some, he may be jammed up. I, I have no idea what, what, you know, where he is on this, but I, but I, I find it hard to believe that if he didn't think it was possible to, you know, uh, if he thought it was possible to have like um, C-130s drop uh, cash on everybody um, just so that people felt flush, that he wouldn't do it. That like I think he would do it. Like I don't think he has any sort of like. Well, as long as his name was on it. Yes, exactly. They would come in like a big, uh, you know, and gold they have envelope. to be like a like Trump a, gold envelope. Trump gold envelope, and maybe like one of those like streamers behind the airplane, <laughs> brought to you by uh, oh by Donald God. Trump. Oh my God. Um. So then, after his really inspiring uplifting speech about how we've prevailed and how the American spirit has raised us above this crisis. And presumably it's behind us. Um, somebody uh, at the white house uh, press conference or Rose garden or whatever it is said, uh, what are you talking about? And this is what he said. Mr. President, you said in Pause your comments earlier, Pause we have met. Pause it for one second. If that's not an image of how we have prevailed and we're past this, I don't know what is. Everybody's like, you know, eight feet away from each other in masks. But continue. Mr. President, you said in your comments earlier, we have met the moment we have prevailed. Uh, to you, sir, is the mission accomplished even with one point? No, we prevailed on testing is what I'm referring to. That was with regard to testing. Uh, you never prevail when you have 90 thousand people, a hundred thousand people, uh, when you have 80,000 people as of today, when you have this, the kind of death you're talking about, when you have potentially millions of people throughout the world that are dying, that's not prevailing. What I'm talking about is we have a great testing capacity now. Uh, it's getting even better. There's nobody close to us in the world. And we certainly have done a great job on testing. And testing is a big, is a very big, important function. By the way, some people consider it more important than others, to be honest with you. But testing certainly is a very important function. And we have prevailed. We have the best equipment anywhere in the world. Okay, please. Yeah. Yeah, we have the best equipment. You know, let's put up a, a graph on, on how we have the best testing. We have the best testing, right. except for uh, if you measure it on a per capita basis. Um, and if you measure on a per capita basis, in fact, uh, we don't. We don't have units. It says this is right. Uh, we don't. Uh, and uh, not only do we not have it on a per capita basis, we were so late in the process that it became largely in many respects irrelevant. Although now, you know, it would be nice to have that type of testing regime. Now we're about to get completely um, uh, snowed by uh, China who are about to embark on a testing of 11 million people in 10 days. Um, so in fact, we have not prevailed. It's also like, does he think that people don't speak English? Yes, he does. And like, the reality is, is, you know, I actually think that our democratic governors who are supposedly like standing up to Trump, they've, they, and the city and the mayors, they're, they're buying this, this bullshit. Like they're actually kind of falling for it to an extent. I mean, look what they're doing in New York right now. They're about to open de Blasio is like, we're going to open up in June. Why? Literally, why? There's still, there's still like no action. No, no, Dr. Fauci's not saying this if you're going to use him as the moral compass. So what the hell is going on behind the scenes? You know, there's like the subtext of what's happening politically in terms of do, does, do, do people speak English? No, they don't. Not even the smart politicians speak English. Like if we're just going to break it down very simply. I will say this, that about a month ago, my prediction was that you would start to see these states opening up by mid-May. It happened a little bit earlier than I anticipated. And what they're going to do in New York and these other sort of like um, packed states 
Northeast PAC states is you're going to wait. And they're going to say, we're going to open up in June because what they want to do is wait because by early June, we should see the results of this. And it's going to make it a lot easier from a political standpoint for them to say, okay, we can't open up in the way that we wanted to because we've just seen what happened in Georgia or we've just seen what happened in this place. And I suspect that's going to be the case. Um, there's a lot more antibody testing going around in New York State. But the problem is nobody's quite sure if this, these tests are reliable because there's been no sort of central clearinghouse and they've just sort of thrown them out, you know, out into the wild essentially. And they're waiting for anecdotal uh, evidence as to, you know, how these tests are doing because they're so far behind. They just want to get numbers on the board so that Donald Trump can get up there and say, we prevailed. But and meanwhile, here's the, the, the messaging game that's happening is confusing. Like you said, who can who understands English? Well, there are people who are, are going to be cautious no matter what. And there are even New Yorkers who are just tired. Like they, they have they have quarantine, you know, itis, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Where they just need to get out. And so every conversation about opening it up, it gets into your psyche. I mean, I'm even falling for it. I'm like, I'm going to go take a drive. That was me yesterday. I didn't go anywhere. I just took a drive because I was losing my mind. Yeah. So if if even the people who are paying attention start to, to like have little habit by habit, you know, break apart their routine, that ultimately is what's going to affect us all. I mean, it, it, whether it's conscious or not. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there needs to be, you know, I mean, the, the problem is we don't have these like broad principles that we need to be following that we that, that are being presented by uh, any type of like authority. Right. Um, and we don't have the institutional and sort of structural support that we need to expand on those parameters. Right. Um, and it's. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we'll see what happens over the next month or two. It's, you know, it's possible that because it's summer, uh, not so much, I think, from a, a heat perspective, but in terms of like a close proximity and closed in perspective, mm-hmm. that the rate of infection will drop. But as people start to go inside more <clears throat> um, or I don't know, I think we're maybe about to find out how uh, central air conditioning plays a role in some of this stuff. I don't know. So I really can I, I don't. Can I bring up an interesting point that um my best friend lives in Switzerland and she she's American. She works for an NGO and they do a lot of international uh, research. And she she goes to, uh, you know, vulnerable countries and does um, messaging like she helps to set up radio stations or whatever. But because of that, she has all this information from like the U.N. and they're studying covid country by country by country. And like the what's really fascinating is looking at the southern European countries and how countries like Italy are are ravaged, Spain are ravaged, but then Portugal has like under, I think it's like under 100 cases. And in Greece, you know, I'm Greek, so I'm very familiar with the Greek people. They've handled it very well. I mean, even if the numbers are not being reported, well, it's 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 still not anywhere near. And so they're trying to understand, you know, is it the cause? Is it because of, of government structures? Is it because one's more authoritarian than another or there's an authoritarian psyche? And so much of it right now, and it's early stages of research, really comes down to how the people are psychologically taking in COVID. So a red state, a libertarian state versus, you know, California. I mean, there's – America is just a completely different scenario. But – um, what they found was similar between Portugal and Greece. I, I would love to see the research behind this. Is there's like this this culture of hypochondria, and I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense because I can't understand why Greeks would, you know, we're so argumentative, <laughs> why we would stay inside. But there's something in like our familiar familial structure, and then there's like skeptics. So there's, I, I'm saying this because you look at someone like Donald Trump who's putting out ideas, like testing them. And it's creating doubt. I mean, this is ultimately, I really think so much of this is a psychological game. And how do we win an election? How do we make sure that that just enough businesses stay open and people are still contributing to those businesses, those who can afford it? And oftentimes, you know, you look at like the wealthier white male, like the there's there's a portion of the population that aligns with, you know, the ones who are not uh, following these guidelines and who want the economy to stay open also have like a little bit more money and you know it's 
th- there's something happening, and I would love to see like the research behind it. You know, ten years from now when we look back, but I think ultimately it comes down to like psychological, political messaging here, and it's very and, scary. And, and I think what Trump is also trying to do is trying to shift the blame for this onto that, and by this I mean the, having to stay in. He wants that to be a socially constructed thing so that there can be an individual or an entity behind it. So it's blame China. So it's blame Democratic governors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Speaking of blame. Donald Trump has unveiled and and I want to get your opinion on this because I was talking about this yesterday. I don't this to me does not seem like it's going to be effective. Like, they're going to have to move on past this, but it, it doesn't appear that they're going to. Uh, and and I, I want to get your – this is uh, – Donald Trump, the whole uh, w- Flynn attempt to exonerate Flynn, Flynn, we still don't know how the, the judge is going to react to this, as, as far as I can tell. Uh, but um, Rick Grinnell coming to the White House yesterday with a special dossier of uh, who unmasked uh, Flynn and um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is all about Obamagate, as President Trump explains yesterday. Mr. President, in one of your Mother's Day tweets, you appear to accuse President Obama of the biggest political crime in American history by uh, far. Those were your words. What crime exactly are you accusing President Obama of committing? And do you believe the Justice Department should prosecute him? Uh, Obamagate. It's been going on for a long time. It's been going on from before I even got elected. And it's a disgrace that it happened. And if you look at what's gone on, and if you look at now all of this information that's being released, and from what I understand, that's only the beginning. Uh, Some terrible things happened, and it should never be allowed to happen in our country again. And you'll be seeing what's going on over the next, over the coming weeks. But I, and I wish you'd write honestly about it. But unfortunately, you choose not to do so. Yeah, John, please. Crime. What is the crime exactly that uh, you're accusing him of? You know what the crime is. The crime is very obvious to everybody. All you have to do is read the newspapers, except yours. Uh, John, please. <laughs> the Obama yeah. crimes. This is it, though. Ultimately, it's like, just tease out some doubt. Tease out some but, controversy. But, but, okay. But who is this? Like, I, look, with Clinton, she had a a vulnerability to this yeah. idea of sort of of of, of how you, however you want to say it, like soft corruption and a sort right. of being a uh, you know a politician that's working for moneyed interests and not your interests, and and so that was effective in at least creating like you may think I'm a horrible person, but you also think she's a horrible person too, like. I don't see how they get from Obamagate by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, even if it was like, and at one point, and 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 please someone mark this, it will go from Obamagate to Obama Biden gate. That's what they will call it. And of course, but, yeah. But but there's nobody who would. I don't think that you can get, I don't think that this sort of realm in which he's operating in is going to, has the ability to suppress votes. Like, I just don't think that like anybody's going to like, I was going to vote for Biden, but all this stuff about Flynn and what was going on with Russia. Like, I just, I'm not going to now, like, that's not going to happen. Do you think so? No, I think that like, he just wants to get his base to show up in the numbers they need and that he needs. And he, I, I agree. This yeah. is a base strategy. Yeah. But this isn't like a suppress um, Biden right. support strategy, which is like, shouldn't they be getting on that? Because well, if they're still having to worry about their own base, I think that they feel like they're in trouble. Well, like I think it, that the, there's part of the base that they think they can move with this kind of strategy that is also Biden's base. I mean, that's what's so strange and prickly about this election is, I don't know. I mean, I really need to under, I don't know the numbers that they're looking at. Like, I think this is like highly micro-targeted and, and probably based on the most likely voters in Wisconsin who are like making over, you know, $75,000 a year and are white men and like their wives that vote with them. And like, are they more susceptible to believing the vast conspiracy theory of, of the Clinton gates and the and then maybe you know sowing doubt in their minds about Biden and then 
who knows? I mean, I, I really don't know, but I think that there's some sort of deep uh, strategy <laughs> that we're not. Yeah, I mean, wh- wh- there, I, there, there must be because uh, it's it, it, to me, it looks like they're mobilizing their base against yeah. Obama. And if they don't already have their base that doesn't like Obama, you know, then they've got real problems. Right. Like they need to be moving on to suppressing Biden a, a vote at one point. And I don't see how they get there from here. But well, that's um, the ultimate game. It's like Biden is there to win the Obama voters that Hillary couldn't get that flipped to Trump, the right. Obama Trump voters. That's it. Our entire country and society is coming down to that. Uh, that's that people. is the case. Call him from an 801 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. What's up, Sam? Y'all, I'm a big fan. Who's Sam. this? Who's right. Tell me the answer. Holy shit. All right. Um, Who is this? Uh, this is Gabriel from Salt Lake. Gabriel from Salt Lake. What's on your mind, Gabriel? Um, yo, so I want to debate you, but I, I just want to say first, I might get a little heated. Okay. Because I'm really strong on this topic, but I really love your show and you're like, my favorite person on YouTube and you've like got me through like a lot of hard times. All right, Gabriel, and I will then, I, uh, I will try not to get too heated, but I also, uh, things are a little tense around here. So, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's do this and, and just make sure that we don't take it personally on both of our, uh, our, our parts. I could never take anything personal from you. You're like, it's, this is why I sound weird to say, but you're like my savior in kind of a way, dude, you really got me through a lot of hard times. I just want oh. to say that. And, uh, oh, well. Uh, like, I, I just want to debate you on the whole voting for Biden thing. Okay. Mm. I, I I don't, like, I get your argument for it. Trump's bad and Biden's, like, incrementally better, right? Correct. But the whole sexual allegation thing. Yeah. Like, I, I, I consider myself to be a feminist in a way, and I want to be an ally to, to the movement. And how can I be an ally if I vote Biden knowing this accusation? Because um, sometimes you're an ally by doing something that's defensive as well. And um, defending um, the movement against Donald Trump is going to ultimately um, be better for people in that movement. I mean, I, I mean, I can tell you that, you know, there the there's plenty of, of of feminist writers that you can see who who make this argument that um, and they are obviously torn like you are. And, and, and I think many of us are. Um, but Donald Trump is obviously worse on sexual assault. I think that Joe Biden, I think that's self-evident. Uh, but he's also worse for women and society in general. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think you it's a defensive maneuver <laughs> really is really what it's coming down for. I mean, a vote for Joe Biden is a defensive vote. There's no doubt about it. You're voting against Donald Trump. You're like, when, but couldn't I, can... I just vote for a third party? And then say, no. like, okay, I just want to have this situation where if I have a daughter and she grows up and asks me, how, do, how could I vote for Joe Biden knowing we have that allegation? Why can't I just vote for somebody third party to have a clear conscience and tell my would be daughter that because, I did the right thing. Because you don't vote for the sake of your conscience. You vote to impact the material um, uh, existence of other people and yourself and your daughter uh, going forward. And from a material perspective, there is no doubt that women are going to fare better under Joe Biden than Donald Trump. That's a fact. That's definitely facts. But uh, like my vote doesn't really matter if you think about it. I'm in Utah. Like, well, OK. All like, right. Listen, first of all, we don't know about we don't know uh, Utah about Utah. Trump. But I mean, if 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 I mean, if you're saying, well, I'm in a state that is not going to be uh, there's not going to be any contention, then the calculus is a little bit different. Right. I mean, yes. If I'm in New York and I vote for, uh, you know, uh, know me i write in know me's name for president joe biden still, i would do that joe well joe biden's still gonna win 
And, and so it, it, my action is less relevant with that, no doubt. And I don't know. I mean, I don't think Utah is going to go uh, for Joe Biden under any circumstance. <laughs> uh, and so, and so, I mean, in Utah, when you talk about Utah specifically, yeah, your vote is not as, as relevant uh, in this instance. And so, you know, okay, if, if it makes you feel, it makes you feel better. Uh, but I, I, the argument I'm making is really about swing states. I, I, I don't, I don't have. I would say even in swing states, like, like I would make the argument to people in swing states, like, yeah, vote for, vote for your conscience. Like, you don't want to have that. Like, let's say Joe Biden wins the election and then everything comes out to be true. Like, but you knew about this, like, how, like, would, like some people might feel guilty. Like, why wouldn't you want them to just vote for who they want to, knowing this allegation? Well, why do stuff? you like, vote? Why do you vote? Do you vote to make yourself feel good, or do you vote because you want to bring about a better society? Well, I mean, you're not going to get a better society with Joe Biden at the helm. I mean, well, no, kind of I think we've established that. I think we've established that you're going to get a better society. I mean, look, just. Look at the response to the this this crisis. Of course, there's no way course. in a million years Joe Biden gets rid of the pandemic planning that was on the National Security Council. There is no way in a million years that Joe Biden gets rid of the the head of uh, pandemic response at Department of Homeland Security. There's no way in a million years Joe Biden cuts back on the CDC um, uh, operations in China. There's no way in a million Are you years. Sure? Yes. There's no way in a million years that Joe Biden throws out the 70 page document that Ron Klain, who is one of his top advisors right now, wrote as a game plan to respond to a pandemic that is indisputable. And so the bottom line is, I mean, look, and you can tell me you're voting on your conscience all you want, but your your conscience should also include the thousands of lives who could be saved if there was just a competent you want to, if you in your mind want to consider him a rapist uh, by all means go to town but a competent rapist at the helm versus a completely incompetent one who has no interest in the functions of government that's just the reality everything else man i i mean like honestly like you if you believe that voting is only about making yourself feel good and not have any implications for other people in society, go to town. Right. But otherwise, I don't know what to tell you. But, Gabriel, I really appreciate the call. Thanks, man. Thank you, Sam. All right. Hang in there, man. There you go. I I, I, I almost got tough. heated. This is a weird one that I, I think, like, obviously it requires suspending all moral, personal moral values. But Of course. Think about... JFK, think about MLK Jr. I'm not saying that, like, if they lived in this era, they wouldn't have treated women the way that they did. Who knows? But um, misogyny runs very, very deep in our society, and it is not spoken enough and understood enough and, and the depths of it beyond rape. I mean, really, it is it's so deeply ingrained in, 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 in humanity at this point that this kind of vote is... It's a little privileged, I have to say it, because as much as I despise Joe Biden as a feminist, as someone who's been a sexual assault survivor, like, and so many other women, I have the privilege as a white woman who, God willing, will be in a safe situation post-COVID, but I also have the privilege as a New York voter. And I have the privilege of exercising my vote however I want to send a message to the power. But the power games, the, 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 the power that we had was in the primary people. The power is not now in the general, and that is the ultimate control of the two-party system. I understand that. But you don't say, like, in the middle of the war, oh, guys, guess what? I have an idea. No, we're in the middle of incoming fire at this point. The time to strategize and to negotiate the strategy was a few months ago, frankly. And and we didn't win that. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons why. But at the end of the day, like my power and my privilege is that this can be a philosophical debate. And like, you know, I'm holding out because I live in New York. But other people don't have that privilege. Right. I'm sorry. Like, right. if you really think that the world is going to be 
the same under Joe Biden, then you are a fucking privileged person. I'm sorry. I'm just getting to that point where it's like, you're privileged. And we all talk about privilege in the left. Well, this is ultimately it. Is this a philosophical debate or is this life and death? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, even as, as, as anemic as things like um, in, in, you know, people perceive uh, the Obamacare, there is a big difference between 10 million people being on Medicaid uh, because of its expansion and not. And, um, and, and, and there is, you know, Joe Biden is going to be uh, surrounded by a wide range of people, and he will tend to listen to those that we don't want him to listen to. But there will be moments where he will have to listen to the ones that we do want him to. And that's that's actually little. a good point. We have demands to make. Of my, my whole perspective here is, listen, I live in New York and go for whoever I want, right? I'm not going to tell people who to vote for, but I also want people to understand the, the significance of what happens if they do not vote in a key state or or do vote for somebody else and not Biden or whatever it is. But we do have demands to make of Biden and we do have power over him in that sense. Like, why is he have Larry? Why is Larry Summers even? Um, why are we even bringing that into the conversation at this point? You know, there are ways we can use our power in this moment to push him uh, more so than Hillary. I mean, Hillary was completely resistant. Com- yeah, I do get the sense that Joe Biden, you know, there's a, there's a there's a quality about Joe Biden's candidacy that is like, look, I know I'm a placeholder and uh, anybody who steps forward and has the biggest, uh, you know, all right, fine, whatever, whatever works for you. You know, like I think there's a, there's a, there's a, I don't want to overstate it, but there is a quality there of that. Call from an 813 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Well, hey, is this me? It is you. And your name is, oh, and you are calling hi. from? Hey, Sam, this is Ashley from St. Pete. Ashley from St. Pete. Uh, yes, Ashley from St. Pete, Florida. Ashley from St. Pete. Um, so, uh, no, Miki, can I try some Greek on you real quick? Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, that was it. The end. Um, <laughs> I'm all red now. I just said, that, uh, how are you real? doing? Nice was that to meet you. That was real. That was real. Yes, that was real. I, I mean, I, I feel cool. obligated to say. Anyway. It's, it's... Uh, I, 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 I'm second generation. Oh, um, awesome. So, well, St. Pete that, is a it. huge that's Kalimnian population. We're, we're going to go Cal- deeper now. Washington. You're from an area where my family's island, um, Kalimnos, you have a huge Kalimnian population. I'm a, from Kalamata. Oh, you're from Kalamata. The but the area in that right. she's from, there's a restaurant called Nomikis. And it's like the only time people know my name is because they're from that area. Because it's mm. a very rare Greek name. Oh, that's name. funny. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, History lesson I over. could get into it, Sam. will probably. <laughs> but you, 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 my mom has the same pronunciation issue, uh, Angeliki. So Angeliki, yeah, similar. Um, anyway, so <laughs> family Sam's crew. Like, uh, it's been the show's been taken over. Flip through. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, Sam. That's I okay. can't see okay. you, but I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so you may have gone over this already, but apparently Donald Trump is refusing to wear a mask in any public event. Yes. Like, no matter the event. Oh, my God. Um, and today, I believe, it was revealed that several of Trump's Secret Service members had tested positive for COVID-19. Um, I think this is kind of being going under the radar a bit. And, and I was wondering what you um, thought because Trump ostensibly is our president, for good or ill, if Trump's refusal to follow basic CDC guidelines signals, one, in the long run, uh, to the more fringe elements of the Trump base, like the QAnoners, the white nationalists, Mm -hmm. militia members, conspiracy theorists, um, how do you think this affects them and their, I, I guess, want to defy authority? Um, everybody from Anthony Fauci to the police. Do you think, um, where do you think that could potentially leave? And just number two, real quick, downstream culture, 
how could this affect the, I'd say, quote unquote, more typical MAGA voter? Yeah. Uh, would just love to hear what you all think about the situation um, in his uh, Trump's flagrant disregard for basic safety measures. Yeah. All right. Anyway, a uh, long time listener. Love your show. I appreciate Thanks the so call. Thank you. Uh, great, great question. I'll let you go and we'll, we'll answer. Great question. And it was also fun to watch uh, you and Nomi speak Greek. That was, uh, that was nuts. Because um, you don't, you don't hear uh, many people speak. Uh, it's not, and, and to Come the extent to that I, <laughs> well, you know, Worcester actually, uh, oh, yeah. Massachusetts has a very big uh, Greek population. I never had Italian pizza until I was, uh, you know, older and Greek pizza is not great. Anyways, <laughs> but um, we don't need to have that conversation. I think this is interesting because I do, in addition to, uh, I mean, look, I'm going to lay this out there. And I hope this doesn't come as a shock to anybody, but I am not going to be upset if Donald Trump catches COVID-19. Right. And um, I, um, I hesitate to come down on whether I think it, I would be happy if he perished from it only because um, I don't want it to... Uh, not because I, I mean, I have any value of his life. I, I don't. Um, I mean, I, I'm sorry, folks, to put that out there. I don't, I hope you don't, mm -hmm. this doesn't hurt anybody's perspective on me. Uh, I just wouldn't want like Mike Pence to come out there like a martyr. Right. And, you know, we need to win this election for the spirit of Donald Trump. Like, I don't know how, I don't know how his authoritarian base would, would, would rally around that or not. So I, I don't want to make it, I don't want to wish for anything uh, that specific, but I would like to see him catch it. Um, of course, but then if he survives, he's going to come out like I'm, right. I'm like a Greek god, uh, just to maintain the theme. But I do think the uh, our caller was right that, I mean, look, I'm in a rural area. I don't go out much. I go to the dump, and uh, you know, once a week, and there's some guys there. They don't wear the masks, right. and I stay away from them. And I've had they say like, yeah, don't worry, I don't bite. And I'm like, well, I'm not worried about your teeth. Um, and it's just like. It is enraging to see people who are just like so cavalier about it. Like, yes, I get it. There's a very low chance that you have it. And there's a low chance that I have it, but we don't know. And we're just, it's not that big of a deal to put something in front of your face. So you're not broadcasting all of your aerialized garbage out there. And, you know, if Trump's not going to wear a mask, then he should be surrounded by people who are not wearing masks and just right. let it roll. And, but I do think it sends the wrong message out to uh, a population that's trying to mitigate this. But he's, and, he's, it's an appearance of weakness in his mind. And, yes. you know, whatever Steve Bannon is still saying to him, if that's happening, um, which I still believe is happening, I think there's, it's just, you know, authoritarians have to be strong times. Yep. I mean, watch Putin, actually. Like, I'm not saying because he's taking his cues from Putin. I'm not going down a Russiagate spiral. I'm just saying watch him and how he responds and how he appears in public. And, you know, it, it really is a, it's, it's a, it's a balance between being a strong leader in a wartime, right? And taking his, his whatever, you know, junk science he's putting out there and his, his business logic to a group of people who, who, are afraid of the economic effects of COVID rather than than the the viral effects. So it really just comes down to like authoritarianism. <laughs> yeah, it. no, I think that's right. I think he's got a play act like he is impervious. And I think mm -hmm. I think I think with Pence, I think it's a, a, an authoritarianism. But I think there's also a quality of like my faith is in God. Yes. I mean, I I remember a clip that we played that actually got removed from YouTube. What? It's the only video that we've ever done that got removed for community guidelines. And really? Matt, uh, Brendan, I don't know if you guys remember this. It's from like a couple of weeks ago. There was a woman who was coming out of like a mega church in a car. And she said, I'm, I'm, I'm dipped in the blood of Jesus. I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. I can't get COVID. And the guy's like, but, but how are you going out? I'm, like, I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. So I'm not worried about it. And uh, that our video, I guess, sort of, Maybe we were not uh, respectful enough about how much blood she was covered in by Jesus. Um, that uh, and if you see Jesus and he's he's looking a little peaked, <laughs> now you know why. Because 
it takes a lot of blood to cover somebody completely in blood uh, to protect them from COVID. But oh, they they got plenty of Jesus blood. Um, there's more of that Jesus blood where it came from. But the the but I think that 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 Pence also is communicating to his people like this is in God's hands. But I gotta give a secular answer because you know these people, you know how it is. Um, well, not only I, that, he's in he's in self quarantine right now or self isolation. Well, I'm now like, he is because his yeah. own um, yeah. his his spokesperson had it. But I didn't hear that about the Secret Service. Um, so crazy. I wish I wish we could have like a, um, I wish we I wish we had like a like a like a like a console that we could we could we could put in everybody's house where you actually just see like barium through a digestive system <laughs> to see uh see where it is spreading in the white house to just see it circle him i feel like that's very funny. i feel like for hours that would be like that w that picks um you know yule time logs that they used to put on their tv show so you could do it during uh, christmas you could watch the log uh, burn that's what i would do i would just put it on there i'd watch that all day all right one more uh phone call we'll get back uh, to some sound you call him from a uh Five five, five five nine, area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Five five nine. Five five nine. All right. Instead, we'll take some uh, IMs. Cool, Steve. Did you see that at one of his press conferences? Uh, five five nine. Are you there? Bye bye. Uh, did you see that one of his press conferences, Cuomo kept saying how good it is that the percent of people testing positive for antibodies is decreasing after multiple rounds of antibody testing in New York. He seems to not understand why we want more people with antibodies. Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't I don't know. I don't get that. Uh, NOI Obama. Obviously, this wouldn't really be a good thing, but wouldn't it be kind of awesome to see Obama and Clinton go to prison? Also, Nomiki is my favorite co-host by far. There's a pretty decent ba fan base on Reddit. I do. I don't do. I, I need to get on Reddit. You got to get on Reddit. I need to like actively get on Reddit. I've been there. Thank you. I um, appreciate that. We talked earlier about Donald Trump trying to um, ignore the natural uh, danger of COVID and focus on the constructed danger of COVID, which is the economic impact and how that would allow him to shift blame because he's failed so miserably in addressing the medical situation with COVID right. by making it all about the constructed implications of COVID, i.e. that you're being forced to stay inside or, or, or not. Uh, he can shift blame onto the Democratic governors or he can shift blame onto you know, Obama gate or whatever it is. And um, one of the other entities that he wants to ship blame on, and we've heard Peter Navarro every time he's on television talks about the Chai comms, um, is the Chinese. And uh, here he, um, he does that. And, and there's some question as to why in that moment he pivoted to blaming the Chinese. Uh, what message he was sending to, I think her name is Weijia Zhang from CBS. Oh. Uh, also, um, uh, Caitlin Collins makes an appearance here, too, in this exchange. Here is Donald Trump uh, asked why he's making uh, COVID response a global competition as opposed to something that they could work on. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please said many times that the U.S. is doing far better than any other country when it comes to testing. Yes. Why does that matter? Why is this a global competition to you if everyday Americans are still losing their lives and we're still seeing more cases every day? Well, they're losing their lives everywhere in the world. And maybe that's a question you should ask China. Oh, my God. Don't ask me. Ask China that question, okay? When you ask them that question, you may get a very unusual answer. Yes, behind you, please. Pause it for a second. Now, pause it. Now, when I first heard about this exchange, I thought there was a rational reason why he was bringing up China. Like, what, you know, like, what? but he's not. He's not. Also, 
if the premise was about testing, like, why would you ask China? They're doing better. Right, exactly. I mean, the, the idea that this is a very generic question mm -hmm. about like, why do you see this as like a, like we are in competition with the entire world to uh, heal ourselves. I, I mean, now maybe they're just like so rife with conspiracy in the White House that they still believe this was a purposeful thing by China as a way of knocking Donald Trump's economy out of the box or something. This was always, so, so I, I swear to God, this comes down to, to Bannon. Bannon, when he was in the e, uh, uh, working on the EU elections last year, he kept, he was doing these long meetings with like Italian fascist leaders on camera talking about how everything needed to be focused on China. That is Bannon's obsession. And what a time to bring up China, this election, trade policies that divided the Obama administration from the Trump administration. I mean, we have to be, Obama wanted to do APAC summits, like APEC summit, like all these different um, Asian. The PPP. Yes, PPP, exactly. So ultimately, I mean, this is this is like it delivered to him on a platter and all Trump has to do is just bring everything back to China. That's right. Like and, and, uh, and, and one wonders if he's looking at the, uh, the question and the first thing is like, why don't you ask China? Here we go. Go back. Go back a little bit. And the way he says it, too, is really he's angry about. It. Go ahead. Our cases every day. Well, they're losing their lives everywhere in the world. And maybe that's a question you should ask China. Don't ask me. Ask China that question. OK, when you ask them that question, you may get a very unusual answer. Yes. Behind you, please. What, sir, why are you saying that to me specifically? I'm telling you, I'm not saying it specifically to anybody. I'm saying it to anybody that would ask a nasty question That's like that. That's not a nasty question. Please lesson. go ahead. Why does it matter? When okay, uh, anybody else? Please go ahead in the back, please. I have, to, I have two questions. No, it's okay. But we'll you pointed to me. I have two questions, Mr. Next. President. Next, next, please. <laughs> but you, did, you called on me. I did, and you didn't respond, and now I'm calling on... Sorry, I just want the to young lady in the back, please. I just wanted to let my colleague okay. finish. But can I ask you Ladies a and gentlemen, thank you very much. Appreciate but it. Thank you very much. People aren't going to listen to me when I say there's a question. You know what? You know what got him really pissed off there, I think, why he got so pissy about it? Like a little baby? Yeah. He did not appreciate the fact that his being try he was trying to be intimidating to the first reporter and when caitlin uh Collins. the the second reporter said do you want a follow up like hey i'm not he's not going to use me to shut you up right. that's i think where he got very pissy about it and then i think when he saw that the third reporter and i don't know who he had called on was deferring to the second one i think that's where he's like i got to get out of here because I'm losing my authority uh, around like I'm, I'm not intimidating people enough. And yeah. so I got to I got to get out of here. I mean, that was he really um, he got very, very pissy. And um, his, I feel like his feelings were hurt a little bit. They, did you hear they sort of shut off her microphone too? the first? Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, I mean, I think like this type of stuff. There, you know, one of the problems that the press has always had is that there's just not enough like impetus to protect their institution relative to their own sort of like career agenda uh, on some level. I mean, I, I, I happen to think that these like um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think given that these things take place and there are moments that make Trump look bad, I think it's helpful for us to play them, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure if uh, I'm on board with the press actually showing up for these sort of freak right. shows. But it's, I mean, right now it's, it's like they don't have anything to lose because it's just so apparently clear how dysfunctional the white house is. And so even asking a question like, was that targeted at me or why did you, I mean, it's pretty basic stuff. They're not asking hard hitting questions here. You know, no, that's not, not I mean, like, yeah, why, like, why, why aren't you, why is this a competition? Yeah. I mean, it, it's possible in his mind is like, well, it's a competition because China is uh, spying on us about the vaccinations. And, but 
well, why not just make it open source? Right. I mean, this is the, the thing that has driven the coronavirus response by this government is how do we monetize? Mm -hmm. How do our friends monetize it every single step of the way? And they're still doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, give me like, how serious does this have to be until you're like, you know, we're going to, was it, was it the Salk with the polio vaccine? Like, yeah. I think it was when he was asked, like, are you going to patent this? He's like, what? Right. It'll be like patenting fire. <laughs> like, he's like, no, this is for, I'm doing this for people. Well, it's just for, like, there was this moment right after the crisis, right? There's always this, anytime we're hit with some sort of disaster, there's this brief little period where it really is humans first. And then the business interests get in line, the lobbyists show up in Washington or virtually, and then suddenly it becomes a political game. Always. Doesn't matter what the crisis is in America, that is, that is how it plays out. And it's not how it plays out in other countries because they just don't have an economic system or a, a lobbying structure like we do. So... Was there even a moment, though, in this country where it was humans first? Because I feel like this administration on day one was like deny, 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 sure. deny. And then it was like, oh, wait a second. Mm, yeah. well, at least Pelosi. Do this. Like there was a conversation about MMT, like in the Democratic right. caucus that went out the window two minutes in. Right. Well, look, I, <laughs> I, we may have more time uh, for that going forward. Um, here is, uh, oh, have you been following these special elections? There's two of them. There's uh, one in California. That's the, the 25th district. That is um, uh, Katie Hill's Kirsten, district. Kirsten Smith. Yeah. And it's Christy Kirsten. Smith. This is the one that uh, Jank ran in, did not yep. do very well. Right. Um, and she's running against a Republican, um, uh, a, I think he's a vet and um, uh, Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that there's any polling, there's been very little public polling. There's been private polling by the Republican that shows him up by a single digit leads. Um, she is, I haven't heard that she's the greatest candidate. I don't know. Uh, one of the things that apparently is hurting Christy Smith in California, at least this is the story, is that that bill that they passed in the state house she's associated with, I think it's bill number five, the one that basically curtails um, uh, use of gig workers right, right. and using them as contractors. Um, and this, you know, Republican oriented um, uh, district. And so they may be hesitant, you know, they may be they still have problems with that. There's reason to believe in the general election, because this is just now from, you know, May until November, mm -hmm. because this is the special election in, in November, there's a reelection for this seat, I believe. And um, I believe there is, right? Because Katie Hill, it would be every two years. And um, in that election, I think regardless of who wins in this one, the special election, you're going to see uh, the Democrat win just because of the sheer numbers of Democrats are going to come out to vote against Donald Trump. In Wisconsin, the seventh uh, district, um, we could have the third Native American uh, woman uh, in Congress with Trisha Zunker. Here's a campaign ad uh, by Trisha Zunker. She is running in a special election against Tom Tiffany, uh, who um, for uh, Duffy's uh, seat, the guy from like, uh, I don't know, a great race or something like their real world. Ho-Chunk means people of the big voice. And my Ho-Chunk relatives were true to their name. They would not be silenced in their beloved homeland of Wisconsin even after being forced away over 10 times on cattle cars to South Dakota and Nebraska, the Ho-Chunk kept coming home. Finally, the government heard the big voice. What happened? Is that it? The, no, the, the video must have failed. Uh, well, uh, Zunker is a lawyer, sat on the board of uh, the ACLU, uh, taught law, I'm not sure where. But a uh, great candidate. And this is like more than anywhere else. This Wisconsin one. And you have to vote in person. I mean, you, you could do the absentee balloting and stuff like that, but you still having voting person. It's not totally mail in ballots. There's been a lot of ballots in this district that have been um, uh, mailed in. This is going to be, you know, another indication of and this is a district that Trump won walking away. 
if she wins in this district in this special election, uh, that's a very, very good sign. Same with California. Like these are places that you could see them going Democratic when people are coming out, particularly in California, maybe in Wisconsin when people are coming out for the election. But if she wins now in a special election where you have a district that is like very leaning towards Republicans, um, that's going to be indicative of the level of enthusiasm. And Donald Trump tweeted out about uh, Christy Smith, I think, in the 25th district, I think. And that's a mistake for him, because if he makes that a national race, that's going to drive people out. I mean, this is these two. Yeah, because it was never Trumpers. That district, a little different than Wisconsin. It was the never Trump movement there. I mean, California is not the Republican movement in California is not a Trump movement. It's a it's it's, you know, a Steve Schmidt movement. (laughs) Like, you know, I mean, it's like that kind of Republican. Right. To the extent that they still exist. Yeah, exactly. Even even them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they all have is, MSNBC contracts. These races are like are ones where um, it, it really they can only show how how much trouble Trump is in, and they either will reveal not much, or or at least they they won't reveal that much, or they will reveal that he's in a lot of trouble. There's no way really to use these to gauge Biden's strength in this instance. This is all just sort of like measuring the referendum against Trump. Well, I mean, so much so that I don't know if you guys saw that email that Bernie sent out about down ballot races. I was I was actually kind of taken aback by it. Um, I don't know who's advising him right now. I feel like it was a really bad political move, even if he wants to support down ballot races. And some of those people on that list were fantastic. And three of them were in New York, New York State senators. I appreciate that. Um, but Christy Smith was on that list. And it just brand wise, I felt like it was a very odd you know, even if he could influence that race, like she could have made asks to Hillary Clinton and gotten the same result. I, I don't know. I just thought it was a very odd uh, push for him, especially after, you know, pulling back his endorsement of Jenks. So something's going on in like Bernie land. I, if I can say it out loud, I just I don't know what he's it just he's making some political moves that are way more conservative, politically conservative, not issues based, but that, too. Um, than he would normally do, like supporting very establishment Democrats because of so much that's on the line right now, understandably so. But it, it just seems like I don't know. I mean, he did that. He did that, frankly, with the the first CARES bill, too. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. the and um, and I think I mean, I, I have no insight to this whatsoever. But my guess yeah. would be he is aware that he is not going to be running another election for president. Right. Um, and that to the extent that he's going to be able to get to do anything with his outside organization. If he, he, he chooses to sort of pursue that outside game, he needs a democratic majority in the house and the Senate and the presidency for that outside organization to be meaningful. I mean, I mean, this is sort of like, you know, this is the same argument as to why you vote for Biden. And you say that we actually have leverage. Like, I think he is he is trying to play a little bit of an inside game, at least enough, so that when he activates his outside game, um, those doors are he's got a toe in those doors. Right. And when he comes in, he's going to come in with an army full of people. I mean, I, I hear you. But like Christy Smith's not loyal to him. I mean, there are a lot of races that he could move. For instance, Samalis Lopez, like that one, lowest turnout district in the country, poorest district. He endorses her. She, she wins in a second. He didn't have to endorse the three state senators who I love. Like, let me be very clear. I, Senator
pandemic is over, whenever that might be. If that's not vote buying, I don't know what is. Vote for me and look what you will get. Look what I will give you. Yeah, because hmm, Bernie Sanders that's... and Kamala Harris need votes right now. Right, exactly. I mean, it's pretty standard. That's also sort of how politics work. Vote for me and this is what you will get. Yes. Um, it is, uh, but it's interesting that there there is obviously an audience out there for like, we need to convince people to get back to work. And it's, they're not staying away because uh, they're afraid of catching the virus. They're staying away because they may not need the money. Uh, that's interesting, though. If you think about it, the subtext. And with that, be, and they also like appear on the show. So it's just some sort of self, you know. <laughs> but with that being said, like, there is there is a question to make about, okay, so if we do give out $2,000 checks, which is not going to pass, but obviously we want, and, and right now Congress is dealing with this literally as we speak, um, does unemployment stay high? It, what is that? What where is where is that push, and how does that affect the general election? Like, if we have social safety nets in place, which we should, does that affect how unemployment plays out? Yeah, but the um, but the fact is, I think the the idea if everybody got that two thousand uh, dollars would pump that money into the economy. Sure. And um, and to the extent that people can go work, they would go work. But you you've now had people sidelined for a couple of months. And they need to, you know, at one point, uh, California just pushed uh, evictions and said now that you can sue your landlord if they attempt to evict you. Um, so it's not just that the landlord's restricted. It's that um, you actually have an action that you can take if you're starting to get harassed. Hmm. Well, people ultimately uh, are going to have to pay their rent. They're going to have hmm. to pay. We have A 7 to 8 percent of people in this country. It might be higher now who have been, um, uh, you know, uh, punting their more. Hey, in which you can get um, unless you're basically saying, well, we're going to hold you hostage and force you to work in a time where you have a significant chance of getting sick. But meanwhile, there's a lot of people going through a lot of tough times right now. Nomi, you know this. Um, It's stressful time. It's difficult. And maybe and I just want to give people a warning up front. Um, some of these stories are, and this is a story of a guy in California who, um, can't go to the beach and he's really upset about it. And he went on judge, uh, judge Janine Pirro's show. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and do we have the intro to this? Cause the intro is almost the funniest part about the whole thing. Dave Rubin on, uh, what did she, how did she introduce him? We got the whole thing. Okay, yeah, let's play this. Just like something like that makes it sound like they're going to bring on somebody who knows what they're talking about. Uh. (laughs) And it, it, (laughs) no, it's like something is, um, it is, wait a second. I have it here. In in beach. Yeah, hold on. Like, uh, oh, oh, wait. Um, here, shoot. Just uh, start it from here, uh, Brendan. Can you play this? Um... Oh, 
know what it is. It's the tweet. Are the strict coronavirus regulations taking away our personal liberties? And then I played it and I realized it was uh, Dave Rubin. All right, so continue. <laughs> That's what made me laugh. I was like. book which Dave Rubin just told me has made the New York but the, whether it's the Sh Shelley Luther or the rest of us what are we going to do to get out of this yeah, well, first off, let me just say that Shelley Luther is a true American hero, and every American should believe that, regardless of their political persuasion. I mean, the woman wants to put food on her kid's table. It's a beautiful thing. I I'm here in California. I live in Los Angeles, so I have a progressive governor in Gavin Newsom. I've got a progressive mayor in Eric Garcetti, who's literally telling me to go out and snitch oh. on my neighbors, and maybe I'm going to get a reward. Gavin Newsom, of course, who's the San Francisco, and he basically ruined that city. And, you know, they're, they're telling us that we can't go to the beach. Well, here in SoCal, it's about 85 and perfect today. And I did get a little color in my backyard. But it's like, how about you tell us something mature? Tell us we have to go to the beach at half capacity and maybe have a car with space between another car and you can only go in group support. Give us something that will make us feel like mature adults as you're supposed to do as government officials. Don't just say you can't go to the beach just because is true just because okay. they worded it. And I think that's the problem with progressives <laughs> okay. generally. They think that because they say something, they it's inherently true. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, you know oh, what's amazing about New York? Let me just say something. Dave Rubin's an idiot. And um, the idea of what he's looking for in terms of these broad principles is exactly what we should be getting from the federal government. I mean, a, a, a mature adult does not think that uh, the broad principles in terms of keeping us safe are any different in one state versus another. Uh, a mature adult, I mean, like, you're worried about mature adults and you're not writing a book about Donald Trump? And stop telling us what to do, don't burn this book. I thought we were supposed to be free thinkers. All right, continue. Just found out this week that some incredible number of people who are staying at home, sheltering in at home, it's like 66 percent, it may be even higher than that, are coming up with the coronavirus. So stay at home, you get the virus. At least let them get tan. You know, a little vitamin D would help them out, don't you think? <laughs> a little vitamin D would help them out. And I'll tell you this, look, my family, I, I come from New York. I was born in Brooklyn. I grew up in Long Island. I lived in Manhattan most of my life. Most of my family so lives in New York. In my LA? sister and her family... You know, the weather's good. I thought we had a beach. Now we don't have it. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Texas is looking pretty good these days. But I will tell you this. My, my sister and her family and he's two kids. He's been saying this about Texas for two years. Go move there. No, he go move buy there. His books. He doesn't want to go live there. He wants of to course, live with the liberals. Of course. Yes. Of course. That guy wouldn't last three seconds in Texas. It's the Andrew Breitbart model. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Hang out with all the champagne liberals drinking Chardonnay. And meanwhile. Exactly. They're the enemies. Yep just moved out of New York City this week because people people want to be free. Span of three minutes he has completely contradicted himself he's so why can't we go to the beach why can't they just tell us have the cars spaced out have the only one third capacity and then within three minutes he's like look um well, i don't want edicts i don't want sacramento right. to tell me what to do let me go out and make my own decision yeah. Like that, that is what is uh stunning about uh dave rubin yeah. he doesn't realize even when he's embarrassed himself it's either they're going to provide for you think are okay, 
or it's you're going to decide on your own and trust all the other idiots down the way to decide on their own. And he's really, really in the first bad instance, he's really bad. In the first I, instance, all he's just mad is like, I don't agree with what you're telling me. Right. I want you to tell me something, but I don't agree with what it is. I, I am seriously, I'm very fascinated by why he's a thing on the right. Like there are people who are just so much better at this. And I mean, they're all evil. Let me make that very clear. But Judge Janine is actually like very good at it. She plays off of people's fears. She has her feistiness. He doesn't, there's, I don't, I can't say like, this is his personality. Like this is his shtick. I really don't understand like why this is a thing he's, in the conservative universe. He's a left apostate. That's, That's why. all it is. That's all it he is. He just sells himself as a former lefty. I mean, we could all do this. Uh, it would take some time and you'd have to spend, you'd actually have to talk with like Ben Shapiro and these idiots and pretend like they're really smart and they're blowing your mind. I have is there any idea, more to Sam. that? Is there any more to that? It's just her conclusion. We can play that though. Yeah. <laughs> Forget it. I but have an idea, Sam. I think what we is could, it? we should go for, from now until the end of the election, go conservative. And then right before the end of the election, ease people, the right populace in back into left populism and, and save humanity. I think we're like, going to need a longer timeline than that, frankly. <laughs> Flip I'm it a little sorry. bit. Um, your numbers will go up. All of our oh, numbers will go up. If we were, if we were, the way that we Gate stuff came out. For like, me, it was um, Hunter Biden. I was just like, oh, man, Hunter. Hunter you're Biden. Such hypocrites. And uh, what's that guy, Brandon Stratikoff? What's that guy's name? Straka. The walk, Straka, the, the walk away guy. I don't know what happened to him. But um, uh, the uh, Brandon Straka, it would be one of those things. Like I suddenly realized, like everything we were talking about. And, and, and then we could go on and talk to uh, Jim Jordan, who you know, he is the guy who. Um, I don't know if he promotes this or is trying to pass legislation where if you are a, uh, a coach or an assistant coach of any type of sport team, that you have no responsibility to report a sexual predator who might be um, uh, preying on your athletes that you're coaching. Is he trying to pass legislation on that or is that just sort of a de facto thing? But here he is. Jim Jordan on uh, Lou Dobbs with Andy Biggs. One second. What number is this? Number nine. Number nine. Three in Chuck Schumer says you mess with the intel community. They have six ways from Sunday to get back at you. January 4th, Peter Strzok overrules the field agents who said Mike Flynn did nothing wrong, overrules them and says Comey McCabe want us to pursue Mike Flynn. January 5th, Obama meets with these top people, Brennan, Clapper. That same group of people in the intel community go up to Trump Tower and brief President Trump at the end of that meeting. Comey does what? Sticks around and talks to the president about President Trump about the dossier that he already knew was false, salacious, unverified and Russian disinformation. And then, of course, 12 days after that, they go set up Michael Flynn. And in between the, the January 6th, when they're trying to trap the president and January 24th, when they trap Michael Flynn, in between that, what do they do? They leak information to friendly reporters to further set up this false narrative. Those three weeks in January tell us everything and the president is exactly right. If it can happen to him, imagine what they can do to you, to Andy, to me, and more importantly, to any American citizen. That's why this is so darn wrong. And, and Congressman Biggs, because this <laughs> happened to a president, uh, there should be great, I, I believe, uh, an insistence upon an accounting and justice. And that includes uh, knowing exactly who is responsible. For uh, what do you believe? 
Well, I think all the evidence, is, Jim gave you a great timeline, but all the evidence does point to coming right out of the top from President Obama on down. And this really was was a conspiracy to do something that we've not seen in American history, and that was to actually perform a coup. That's really what this was. I mean, you can't get to it uh, any more succinctly than that. This was an attempt to undermine the election of the people. That's a that is a very serious allegation. Yeah, it is. It was a coup. It was a coup. I thought that the uh, Trump administration has basically been arguing the past three years that a president can is, you know, above reproach and can't do anything illegal uh, right. while in office. Well, it is while only if you're an actual citizen of the country. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. There you go. Oh, um, I, I, I just like. I have to say, this is, you know, and uh, circling back, we were talking about this earlier. I, I, I think this is indicative of their having no theme to attack Biden. Like, what is the value of this politically? It's only for their own base. And, the, and, and if they're worried about their base, and I get that, you know, you're dealing with the, you, you, know, you, you know, you're in May. Maybe you feel like you got some time, so you're shoring up your base. But this seems like this seems like a little bit of a panic yeah. to me. I mean, it's like, maybe it's just because this is what Donald Trump wants, and it, you know, and and, and that's it. And he just needs this for his own sort of mental stability. That makes sense. Like they're sitting in a room telling him to do certain things. He's like, no, but let's pin it on Obama. He's like, all right, fine, throw it out there. It's, the story is not going to go anywhere after you know three weeks. It's going to die out, and we're going to have to go back to our original strategy. But there's enough room to give Trump one of his little ideas. I think maybe that's it. I mean, I, I mean, but I, if this is all they got, I mean, that's a pretty good sign. Let's go to uh 773 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? This be Uchi Wally, man. Uchi Wally. How are you, sir? Okay. Um, you really hit home with uh, today's interview because uh, I originally called in as Blaine from Chicago, but I was born in the St. Louis area mm. and uh, you're, the guy you were interviewing made a reference. I'm not sure you caught. Did you hear him say, talk about Homer G. Phillips? Um, no. What, in what context? No, I don't remember it. He, he mentioned it in passing. He didn't mention what it was. It's a hospital in the St. Louis Oh, area. yes, 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 yes. Was a, the hospital enclosed in uh, like 79 or something like that. Yes, yes. It was a very big deal um, because it was the uh, something like one third of black physicians in the country were were tr being trained there at one point, and um, when it was shut down, it really decreased the access to health care that still in, hasn't been restored in this COVID time. So you have to wonder if that hospital was still open, if the survival rate for black people in St. Louis would have been a little bit higher. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, also, I would like to point out there's 4,500 people watching the stream right now and only 991 likes, which is unacceptable. That needs to go up by several hundred before this call is over. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll also take a quick stab, if you don't mind. I see a lot of people getting triggered, especially on the Reddit, by you and Michael supporting people, uh, supporting uh, the idea of voting for Biden. I'll start off by saying I don't like Biden either. I didn't like Clinton. I didn't like the... Uh, the talk about bringing black children to heal because that's how you treat dogs, not people. Right. And uh, I'm really pissed at Biden because of his support of the bank's bankruptcy bill or co-authorship of yes. it. He's really a horrible politician. And I never, I supported and donated money to Bernie because I don't want people who do things like the bankruptcy bill and his general politics in office, but we're not going to get Bernie on the democratic ticket, but it looks like we're going to get Biden if his, uh, senility doesn't take him out before right. then but right uh, again i'll mention a book i'm really a fan of called by james gilligan called why some politicians are more dangerous than others hmm. and uh, uh the book's about how when republicans are in the white house the country gets worse and democrats no matter their politics their individual politics the country gets better uh, even middling democratic policies like the clintons can result in a much better country um, one particular thing I want to point out is, is that uh, unemployment is a problem that causes wealth inequality because, of course, people who uh, don't have any income have to draw upon what little wealth they have to survive, pay rent, 
buy food, feed their kids, stuff like that. So the more unemployment a person suffers, the worse inequality gets. And the more uh, unemployment we have, the higher the suicide rate goes, which is sort of, sort of obvious, but a point that needs to be made. When you have a Democrat in the White House, what you find is is that, uh, for, what does he say here? Um the duration of unemployment has been longer in the times that Republicans are in the White House. And it's shorter when Democrats are in. From 1948 through 2003, the Republicans changed the net cumulative increase of 24.6 weeks of unemployment among those who were unemployed. And the Democrats, we saw a net increase of 13.6 weeks for a net difference between the two parties of 38.2 weeks, nearly nine months. In other words, people are in on unemployment shorter periods of time when they become unemployed when Democrats are in the White House than Republicans. And so with, with that having so many knock-on effects, lifetime decreases in wealth, uh, changes to the suicide rate, I, I, I think you've got to look past the fact that Biden is not going to be the guy that we wanted and vote for the guy that's actually going to you know cause less people to die. Of course. I, I mean, I, I just think this is just, you know, I, I mean, it's it's a basic calculation. And, you know, I think if someone is going to um, to not vote for Biden specifically because and I and, and I got to be honest with you, I'm a little skeptical about uh, a significant portion of the people who are saying this, to be honest with you. But if you're not going to vote for Biden um, uh, because he's and, and, and look, I'm talking about in the context of a swing state, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm talking because I perceive voting to be a s strictly material exercise. And uh, in states where it is quite obvious that uh, Biden's going to win or Trump's going to win, th this, this thinking is ir irrelevant. I mean, it, it's, it's irrelevant across the board in many respects. But in a, uh, a state where it's a swing state, where it, it's possible that your vote will um, impact the outcome of, of, of the election. The idea that you see voting as a mode of expression or that it is a means in which to confirm your own personal uh, morality or ethics is absurd. It's not why you vote uh, any more than you uh, swing a hammer because you want to show that you have, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the ability to swing a hammer. No, you swing a hammer to hit a nail and to nail something in. And that is why you vote. You vote for a specific outcome. I, I don't think that there's anybody who really has spent any time looking at what government does and has spent any time looking at history who could argue that Joe Biden is not going to provide material improvement a net material improvement to at least one person. I think it's would be yeah. far more than that than, 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 than Donald Trump. I mean, it's just not, you cannot make that calculation, um, uh, you know, an, an opposite calculation without, you know, being disingenuous. I mean, that's just a fact. Yeah. I mean, if you want to say like, I only vote to make myself feel like I'm righteous, then okay. And if you want to say like, I can't vote from an emotional standpoint uh, it just makes me, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, sick to my stomach and, and I'm willing to, you know, um, you know, hope for an outcome where Donald Trump wins, then, OK, then you're at least being rational and consistent. But any other uh, argument is just is just silly. But it's still the frustration. Yeah. You know, people have so much anger at the Democratic Party and, and there was no end point right it was like the primary sort of ended but didn't yeah. you know and it was it, it, it we had a more you know, people are mourning and they're projecting their anger at the de legitimate anger at the democratic party but i also think like in the media space the left media space we have an obligation you know whatever i'm not gonna tell people who to vote for i think at the end of the day i just i just personally can't do that i have i can make a case as to why if you're in a swing state you should do something different but I think we in the media and the left media have to be very sensitive of this, too. You know, what are we getting out of ripping apart the Democratic Party right now? Listen, we all know, we know the case for why the Democrats are bad. But continuing that argument in the middle of a crisis, you know, you pick your battles at certain times. And that time is over temporarily. I mean, After look, the election, you want to reform? 
get on the ground, start organizing, run for these seats. You know, if you want a third party, build it. But you're going to give all your power to some random green party that you haven't, do we know enough about? That's what I'm trying to say is like, for all of the values we put into the Democratic Party and we want them to live up to our values, right? To, To throw your vote out towards the green party that you know nothing about, like, what are the standards here? Do you see what I'm I, saying? Yeah, and I think it's actually a, a perfectly appropriate time to go after someone like Nancy Pelosi because anything that you can do sure. to undercut um, her power is not relative to Republicans. She's not in danger of losing her seat. That's right. It is. No. Um, it, it is undercutting her power within the context of the Democratic Party. And it's still an interesting battle. Um, and in those battles, yes, you fight. But in a context where that is over, which is specifically the primary, uh, then it just doesn't make any sense. Right. Uh, if I could point out one thing real quick. No. Um, in the book, you also know <laughs> that uh, ever since Woodrow Wilson was president, with two exceptions being Eisenhower and Carter, uh, every Republican president has seen an increase in violent death that brought it up to epidemic levels. And yeah. every Democratic presidency has seen those uh, levels drop below ep- epidemic le- levels. Mm-hmm. So I, I think what the problem, one problem we'll see is just the total death rate, the suicide rate, the murder rate, and the total death rate goes up under Republican administrations. And that's something alone I think I'll, uh, voting for Biden isn't going to do a big deal for me because I'm registered to vote in Illinois and it really doesn't matter who I vote right. for. But the people in the swing states need to decide which one of those two outcomes they're going to bet on. Uchi Wally, appreciate the call. Okay. Nice right. talking to you again. You too. All right, folks, that's it for uh, phone calls. But uh, I will read uh, some uh, IMs and then we'll we'll get out of here. Um Dr. Eric from Connecticut, from New Jersey, sorry. Uh, MR crew just wanted to share from the ground the modest silver lining that we've gotten things that we've gotten much better at treating COVID infections in the hospital. Our treatment modalities have evolved. Despite no vaccine, no significantly effective antiviral, we're seeing more stable discharges, fewer deaths, fewer patients getting intubated. The most important thing is not waiting until one becomes severely ill to seek treatment. This does not mean we spike the football, of course. Well, that's good. I mean, the 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 other factor that we don't talk about in regards of all this is, can we make the implications of getting infected less? And that means like where you don't have long term uh, problems, you know. They were joking about vitamin D on that uh, uh, Gene Pirro, uh, Janine Pirro and but there is evidence that uh, high levels of vitamin D or low levels of vitamin D are associated with more complications. Hmm. So, you know, so that might be the sunlight, you know, when people are saying warmer climates, that could be part of it. uh, But it could, I mean, we don't know. That's the thing is it may not, the vitamin D may be a second order, uh, it's, you know, indicator of something else, but it don't cost much to take some extra vitamin D. Let's put it that way. Or get out, get some sun if you can. Stand outside. Um, Gons, test. Please have Tom Sharpling on the Majority Report. We should do that. He's the godfather of the Majority Report. Great godfather. Local pizza historian. Look, Sam, people keep saying that not voting for Biden is a vote for Trump, but that must also mean that voting for Trump is a vote for Biden, which means if I vote for Howie Hawkins, I get to vote three times and make my vote three times as valuable as yours. I don't get it. Uh, Benito, Sam, please share your CBD routine for help sleeping. How much do you take? How long before going to bed do you take it? Um, we're going to start advertising these guys next week. And I got some of this. Really? Yeah. Does it work? Uh, I feel th- like CBD a- is like, it, it doesn't do anything to me. You know what? Uh, Matt was the same way. And Matt has a different perspective now. This stuff is from a, a farm in, uh, in Vermont. Sunset Lake CBD. We'll, we'll we'll talk more about it. But they, some of it. I mean, I I take the 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 oil, and I've tried it in the past. And what I do now is I take it like 15, 20 minutes before I go to bed. 
Wow. And I'm sleeping better. I'm not, you know, like it, it, it seems to work. And I only take one, uh, like, I don't know, three quarters of a dropper. And generally I'm, you know, sort of immune to that stuff. Generally I just like Ambien's the only thing that can knock me out, but wow. this, I sleep well. Angel, is the argument, uh, the, this is the argument that won me over with Sam four years ago. Your vote isn't about your own conscience. It's about minimizing suffering. That's right. Dad, I don't understand the Trump versus Biden argument. Both of these big, beautiful men would make a fine last American president. <laughs> Uh, Grandpa Sanchez, the outcome of the Supreme Court is reason enough to vote for Biden. Yeah, of course. Yeah. A square. Wow. Big bet made by 45 campaign that more of their base will be activated with Obama lock him up narrative than black people that maybe sat out 2016 election. Every day you think these people in the mad court have hit rock bottom. Mm. And then yesterday, presser with empty testing boxes and testing accomplished banner and 80,000 lives lost. Mm -hmm. Matt from Mass, a vote for a third party isn't exactly as bad as a vote for Trump, but yes, it still helps Trump more than a vote for Biden. Listen, the only argument against voting for Biden that isn't based upon immaterial moral concerns is an accelerationist argument. You have to be okay with the possibility that things will get way worse for people before it gets any better. Stop making a personal moral argument against Biden. The left isn't about moral scolding, whatever the right says. It's about improving the material conditions of as many people possible. Also, Sam, you should get Saul to read the Red Walls book. They're sweet. Oh, the Red, Red Wall. I'll do that. Um, yes, that's right. And, and the accelerationist uh, argument, I just, yeah, I need to see some evidence. Listen, the Labor Party, like, let's think about this. The Labor Party would have never had uh, Corbyn as a nominee if there wasn't a coalition, right? Cor Corbyn needed the neoliberal coalition, who kind of threw him under the bus at the end, but, you know, put that aside. He needed them to be able to 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 build a stronger labor party. Syriza in in Greece needed a coalition of the center European left and beyond and the, and the communists. You know, some of those factions split off and Syriza wasn't as strong and lost because the communists were angry that X, Y, Z things didn't happen. And they were making a moral argument. And as a result, that moral argument at that moment weakened Syriza and now you have a right wing extremist. So yeah. ultimately, these coalitions matter at this moment. There is a time where you have that negotiating power. That time is not now. Yep. I mean, we can make negotiations on policies against Nancy Pelosi, but in terms of the electoralism of, of the presidential primary, I mean, ultimately does come down to a moral question. Are you willing to let children in cages who have COVID be put in uh, other cages in, in, in solitary confinement? Because that's what's happening right now. Yes, Obama was, you know, a deporter in chief, but he didn't put children in cages. A uh, foreign agent. So uh, Numaki went for a drive, which means that she owns a car in New York, no less, and no, maybe no, no. even can afford a private parking space. That's Sounds like the petty bourgeoisie has infiltrated the majority report. Well, I can say that, uh, <laughs> A, I don't think you have a car. I do not have a car. B, yeah. you're not in New York at this time. And C, you do not have a private parking space. I definitely don't have a private. I will. Let me clarify. I am staying at my grandparents' house in Arizona, and I was driving my mom's 11-year-old Prius around town, which I think we filled up the gas tank when we first got here and is still not a quarter. It still has a quarter gas left. So we just do groceries. And I'm the person who drives in the family um, to uh, go get things. So there you go. But... Um... Uh, isn't I, I thought that that is like the, the don't we have uh, petty bourgeoisie uh, as like part of our uh, description on on our show <laughs> description? Isn't that? Yeah, I think the infiltration happened a while ago. Oh yeah, part of I thought it was part of the genesis. <laughs> I, I that's what I thought too, right? Uh, bang and bang bang Bart. Um, uh, can you please get someone uh, with a real argument about the Trump v. Biden vote? Everyone that is called in is just doing the vote my conscience nonsense. It has no historical material analysis. Please get an actual leftist intellectual who can articulate how a Biden presidency is materially worse for the leftist project than a second term of Trump. There are plenty out there. Even Matt Cushbaum can blow your argument out of the water while frying on LSD. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah, send me an email with, uh, with someone you'd like on. I'm happy to do that. Uh, I'm unemployed and poor. I know that a Biden presidency won't be any different for people like me, but I'll be sure to check my privilege so that no, no McKee will stop shaming. Well, I'll tell you this. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that um, 
we are seeing a higher incidence of 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 low income people who are dying in um, in this COVID nineteen. There is a material difference right there, totally. just off the top bat. I mean, I don't even have to go more than six weeks or, or earlier. Just the preparedness for just the natural disasters would um, would make a difference. The idea that like the expansion of Medicaid. Um, now, yes, it may not ha- ha- help you specifically, but broadly speaking, um, the there is a net material difference. The most vulnerable members of our society, the most whether it's nurses being able to continue to have unions at these moments, you know, I, I will bet you Biden will not be cracking down on the right of nurses organizing right now. You know, he might have a long term agenda, but not in the immediate crisis moments. That's actually where in these crises, that's actually where neoliberals perform a little bit better because they're so long game. And like, how do we slowly move towards a more conservative government? And I'm not shaming you. I think people are hearing what they want to hear. I specifically said, I am not telling you who to vote for. I am making a case as to why this is this this argument needs to be looked at from a different perspective. I mean, it's it's it doesn't come down to a philosophical debate at DSA meetings. I'm sorry. Like, there's a moment where we have to like put that down and say this is real life. And if we want to look back in history and say this is the difference between having a fascist in government or not, I think you kind of want to be on the right side of history. And, and and I want to make something clear. To the extent that anybody is shaming anybody, it is me. <laughs> I'm shaming. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if I'm actually shaming, but I'm, so I'm certainly happy you, to Sam. shame if you want. Colorado guy, for Colorado residents or anyone listening, if you're looking to donate to a food bank that services all, including undocumented Americans, Bienvenidos Food Bank offers emergency food assistance to people in need. Oh, Much great. love, everyone. Stay safe. Uh, Jr. Jeff from Harris. And I, uh, Biden is a placeholder for, for anti-progressive values. I think you should be qualifying that phrase. Uh, and I feel like it would be a bit more honest if you folded in the fact that Democrats are subverting the democratic process when you advocate the pragmatics of voting. It's like recycling. It's bullshit. But of course... You should do it. And people who simply wag their uh, their finger about its moral imperative do often come across as being full of it. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not making a moral argument. I'm making an argument about the, uh, the net material benefits. And frankly, I also can make an argument that the left is in this country does better in terms of growing in strength. Right. with a centrist government than it does a, a far right one. And I base that only on my experience in the past 30 years. But it is a moral argument. The net, it, it really is. It's materially. Yeah, people, minimizing suffering, I guess you could yeah. make is, is also a, a moral imperative. But I, you know, I just, like, you can't make a materialist argument that Trump is better than Biden. I think this is like, these are the arguments that people are making who just like love the game of politics and the competition of politics. And like, we love it, of course, but there's a moment where you have to step outside of the intellectual conversation and think about the real life consequences and feel the pain or try to feel the pain of the most vulnerable members of community. Go watch a documentary right now about uh, you know, uh, I, I spent like four hours down a rabbit hole of 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 the Mexican cartels and how people are being held hostage because they're just being held waiting for their their lawyers during COVID. And the Mexican cartels are now using the people being held hostage at the border to get money, kidnapping these these members at the border who are being uh, detained, get money from their families in America or they're killing them. That is what is on the line between being detained for a little bit longer than the Obama administration. It's, a, it's also the point that Nomiki says, like, do people really think that our political opponents, the corporate Democrats, are really so afraid of another Trump term? Do you think their power is threatened by that? Or who do you think is really hurt by another Trump term? It's not those guys. It's not the people we actually need to beat. I mean, this I I. It's going to be like this all summer, but I just think we've already covered this ground so many times. Yeah, I agree. No, I know. Krista, upstate New York. Uh, great show today, guys. Uh, Nomiki is awesome, and the callers have been pretty decent. 
And the final I am of the day. People love this topic. Hoach Libling, I'm a Marxist Leninist who's voting for Joe Biden. Electoral politics is for harm reduction until we build up a proper movement that can actually beat the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party. The here, left here. That's yes, I think that's a, that is the best way to put it. The left needs to spend time educating people in their neighborhoods and workplaces and actively infiltrate the Democratic Party at local levels first. Yes. Folks, great way to end the program. Well said. Nomi, as always, a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Everybody else, see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught, but see the truth.